Hello, welcome to the January 20th, 2023 Club Cubase live stream. I'm going to do a quick audio test and then we will begin. So bear with me just for a moment. All right, everything sounds fine in my monitoring computer. My name is uh, Greg Undo and I'm the host of the live stream. I work for Yamaha Corporation of America and my duties primarily focus on Steinberg products and we are the United States distributor for Steinberg. And um, so, and I'm presenting from outside of Washington DC area in the United States in Alexandria, Virginia. If you are watching the live stream live, please feel free to introduce yourself. And even if you're watching on a replay, you could introduce yourself and tell us where you're from in the comments field. It's always fascinating to see people from all over the world on the live streams. If you have not attended a live stream before, how it works is we could ask questions in real time in the chat field, or you could send questions in advance to clubcubase at steinberg.de. Uh, we'll go through each of the questions chronologically. Um, if you don't see an immediate response to your question, realize that as the live stream goes on, I'll, we'll, I may be behind 20 to 30, sometimes 40 minutes, um, but I will do my best to catch up and get all the questions answered. So if you don't get an immediate response, if we could refrain or not uh, ask the same question repeatedly, that would be helpful. Um, when asking questions, if you could specify which level of Cubase you're running, so whether it's Cubase LE, AI, Elements, Artist, or Pro, or version 10, 11, or 12, uh, and which operating system, that information is often helpful. We should have a index of all the topics discussed in today's live stream uh, post, uh, pinned to the top of the comments field with timestamps uh, several hours after the live stream. I basically have to go back, rewatch all the live streams, uh, rewatch the live stream and type up all the questions that were asked. Um, so look for that. And if you wanted to search for topics uh, that have been covered in previous live streams, you can go to cubaseindex.com. Uh, and Jan from Stockholm has been kind enough to create that site. We also want to thank two people that serve as moderators on the live stream. So we have Agent K and Jazz Dude. So they're not Steinberg or Yamaha employees. And they just do this to make it a better community. So we want to give special thanks to them. Also, Jazz Dude will give us another thanks for his work with the Cubase Nation Discord, which is a wonderful resource of information for the Steinberg community. So with that, we will go ahead and begin. I'm going to just kind of pop out my chat here so I could, don't have to refresh as much. All right. All right, so the first question, um, how do you use automation to increase or decrease on one or two bar parts? Okay, so let's say I wanted to uh, take this particular uh, audio file here. I'm going to open up the automation lane. Uh, and even if we have, if we don't have automation, what I could do is just grab my range selection tool and I'm going to select a range like so in the automation track. And then I could basically increase or decrease the volumes just on one or two measures. So whatever the selected range is. So if I wanted to do a quick automation bump, I could just again, select the particular range and move the top center line straight up or down. So that's really all you'd have to do for that. All right, so we have a question. Uh, when I set VST windows to always on top, they will only stay on top when a project window is selected. How can I make them stay on top when I click on a non, a non Cubase app like Chrome? Um, so I think that's really kind of up to the operating system level. So there's no way for us to dictate what is on top when, once you're outside of the Cubase environment. So we can only do so much within our control uh, before it gets to kind of the operating system level. So there isn't a way in Cubase to, if you have another program that's active to keep the windows on top, it's kind of designed and what we have... I think all that we could do as a developer is to kind of have the on top behavior only function while we're in our particular program. So, okay, so we have a question. Um, 
Hi, coming from Pro Tools Logic, both having a mixing window slash instrument track, the option to change instruments. Does Cubase has this feature? So I think we could do it with MIDI tracks. So let's say if I have a MIDI track that's being routed to a VST instrument rack and we go to our, uh, and we look at our particular MIDI track here, that when we go to the routing page that we could choose to send this to uh, any any MIDI port that's on the system with instrument tracks, it's going to be the audio routing is tied in. So once you load an instrument track, that's going to load up the instrument and all of its entire audio signal path. So this will show you just kind of a particular, just the audio path in the routing. So, but here we could, with MIDI tracks, you could just choose whatever you want to work with. So if you have a particular part let's say okay this is you know from an electric piano part and i had some midi notes in this and i wanted to send it to another track really all i'd have to do is come over here so we have these particular notes and you know i could just copy that to you know that midi data from an instrument track to a midi track uh, or vice versa if you needed to so uh, but an instrument track will kind of default to the particular audio path as opposed to like the midi output path so all right so we have a question from cutler station uh using cubase 12 and having issues snapping when audio warping i can only snap on the whole note Okay, so let's say I wanted to do audio warping here. We're going to set our free warp. Um, so make sure that we have the grid. So if we're doing kind of a free warp here, so let's say we go to, and we have our grid set to bar. So now when I kind of draw in warp markers, it's only when I go to snap, uh, it's only going to snap to the bar level so as we can see it's going to snap to the bar if i go to the beat it's not going to snap but here we could have it just kind of you'd like do a kind of a little like tunk right in there where so if we set this to beat now when i move this warp marker we could have this automatically snap to a particular beat or if we wanted that to go to a particular quantize value, so let's say, okay, I want to do eighth note triplets um, or quarter note triplets. So now when I come to snap, it will just automatically snap into quarter note triplets. So check your grid settings here and it may be, and by default it may be set to bar. So choose beat or use quantize and then you could set different rhythmic values for your quantize for the grid functions. So let me know if that's helpful. Wonderful to see Robbie Bowling from Dallas, Texas. We have Mark Winslow from Hawaii saying aloha to everyone. All right, we have Benny from Sweden. All right, Matt Elston checking in from London. All right, and we have Antoine Van Campen checking in from uh, from the Netherlands. I won't necessarily try to pronounce the, the town name. So, all right. Um, so we see what is the current status uh, with regards to the Cubase performance issues on Intel Core twelfth generation or newer hybrid architecture CPUs. So I know that you know most. Most companies, you know, I think that this is like where we have kind of faster CPUs and some slower CPUs that kind of work in conjunction. So, um, so I know that the team is investigating it. Um, so I don't think it's going to be like an immediate fix. It's a pretty significant under the hood uh, architectural change. Um, so, uh, but I know that the team is working on it to make sure that people are getting the most out of their CPUs with that and it was just kind of an odd approach from Intel all right uh, so we see John Costigan from uh, 
Kenosha, Wisconsin. Thanks for being on. We see Jan from Cubase Index on. We see Jazz Dude. All right, we have Stefan from Sweden. We have Captain Energy Music from uh, outside Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Thanks for joining. Brian Sawyer from Beulahville, North Carolina. All right, and wonderful to see Mark Rabin on. All right, and we have Nelson from South Africa on, and we have someone from Korea. I wish I could read your name, but um, I'm ignorant. Thanks for joining us. We know it's very late there. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Um, okay. This is my chat field just jumped on me. Okay. Uh, so we see from Patrick question. Um, uh, hi, Greg. On film scoring, how do you make the video still without striking? Um, so I'm not sure what striking means, but let's say maybe shrinking. Uh, but let's say if I wanted to come to a particular, I'll just do a new project. Create empty and I'll just import video file. Okay, so and I think what this might have been was, so let me just, like when we have our video here, so let's say we open up our video window by hitting F8, that as we play, we'll see kind of our video play. So, and I think what the question, um, was dealing with was, you know, we want the video to uh, automatically um, not not change size. And the video isn't necessarily changing size. So let's say when we look at bars and beats here and we want to add, let's say, a ruler track. And my ruler track, I will set this to seconds. So we can see that our video here is um, two minutes, 50 seconds, two minutes, 48 seconds, roughly. Okay, so now if I change my tempo, um, notice that when we zoom in, that the video is still two minutes and 48 seconds, but the video part is just shrinking because as we adjust the tempo, our timeline is changing, but the actual video is staying at the same exact time. So, you know, as you adjust the tempo here, uh, you could have the video kind of automatically follow. Now, if we have um, this particular video, so we could lock the video if we wanted to, and let's just come over here and see if we go to our track control settings. Yeah. so. Um, but it's playing back, the video is playing back in the same exact time. So let's say we come over here and let's say I adjust my tempo to, you know, but the video itself is playing again at this, it's not speeding up or slowing down based on the tempo changes. So the video is independent of the tempo changes, but how it's displayed on the project window may seem like it's shorter, um, but the video is playing back the same exact time. It's just that you may have more or less measures. And again, the key is just kind of looking at the time and not the bars and beats. So as we adjust the tempo, we could have uh, we make the tempo faster, we have more measures, but the time is stays absolutely the same for the video. So let me know if, if that's what you were wanting to find out, Patrick. Uh, 
All right. Uh, so you just see, uh, hi, Greg. I'm from Philadelphia. I'm having trouble panning MIDI notes in the key editor, Cubase Pro 12. So um, it's, it's easy to do. So we just use kind of like a MIDI CC message for MIDI CC 10. So if we are take a particular MIDI note, so let's take a little MIDI phrase. Just check my. Okay, so now that we come here, all right, and I'll just sync these views. All right, so now that we want to come over here, all you have to do is just draw in uh, MIDI. If you want to do it in the MIDI editor itself, you could just come over here and go to MIDI CC 10, and then you could just kind of pan in. So now as we play. So we could do panning just like that. We could also, if we, have it going to an instrument track, we could uh, automate the panning. So if we just wanted to come here, let's automate. So I will click on uh, right. And now as I come over here, we could kind of pan the. So we could pan uh, going that way. Now, if it's a VST 3.5 instrument, Really, all you you know. One of the cool things is we could actually take particular notes, and if we go to our note expression, we could just say, okay, I just wanted to adjust panning. So I'll say, okay, let's just look at panning, and then I could take individual notes and choose to do panning independently because generally how MIDI works is that the one particular. Uh, the one particular uh, pan will be for the entire channel, but if you wanted to double click, and if we have this option open to uh, double click opens the note expression editor, um, in, instead of double clicking deletes the notes, um, at this point we could just select panning and then just kind of draw in individual panning on individual notes if needed, so. Give that a shot. Let me know if that makes sense for you. All right, so we see a question. Uh, please explain the purpose of auto select events under cursor. When I turn it on and try to select a bunch of clips, uh, some of them highlight and some don't. I can't really figure it out. Okay, so let me just, uh, just go to a different project here. Okay, so um, I think we could. All right, so I think it's also gonna be based on the track selection. So if the track is selected, and really the intention of this particular feature is um, like really aids if you have a control surface. So if we come to the preference and say, okay, let's go to our preferences and uh, under editing, we'll say auto select events default under cursor. So now that we have this particular track selected, uh, as we go over, our cursor moves over the particular event, that event is selected. So if you had a control surface, you could just say, um, I just wanna come here and put this. So as soon as my, like I'm using a jog wheel here, but as soon as my, um, you know, and, and as soon as let's say my cursor is over a particular event, 
that we could, at this point, as you move the cursor, that event is selected. So if I wanted to do this for multiple events, multiple tracks, as I you move the cursor over them, so let's say, okay, let's just shift, select, and now as we, and you may have also some different preferences that can, you know, automatically select tracks to so check out this preference. Um, and let me just make sure track selection. Now this could also be uh, an impact where track selection follows event selection. So if I turn that off and I have these three tracks isolated, now anytime that I hover over the selected tracks, those events are selected. So it's really a way of selecting events with a controller without having to physically come up to uh, and click on it with the mouse to select a particular event. So if you had a controller, you could just say, okay, I'm just here. And now those events are selected and I could choose, okay, I just want to delete those. So it allows you to select, but again, check. Uh, it's going to be on the selected tracks. And it could conflict with this other editing preference of track selection follows event selection. So if with the track selection follows event selection, I could lose the track selection if it's only, if there's only one event in that amount of time, then these two tracks would become deselected. So let me know if that makes more sense now, but think of that option again for selecting events on a project window without having to physically click with the mouse, uh, especially if you have a controller, it's a great function. All right, so we have Susu V checking in from uh, Tampir, Finland. Thanks for joining us. All right, so Ted Springman, wonderful to see you back. Uh, says, hi, Greg. Santa gave me an Arturia Mini Moog soft synth. And interestingly, it's capable of processing external audio through its filter envelopes. It goes in the effects section with Envelope Shaper. Uh, was Wish Envelope Shaper was full. Uh, ADSR. Um, so... Uh, so oftentimes what happens if you have a plugin that could process, and we could do this as part of the VST3 spec or 3.5 spec, maybe 3.6 is when this was added. So let's say if I wanted to add an instrument track um, at this point, and we could do it in our retro log instrument. So often what you would do is activate a side chain. So turn on and activate the side chain. And now this particular source can be fed in. And here we have our input oscillator. So that's how we could get a track, let's say our lead vocal directly into, uh, to run through this synthesizer is often side chaining it. So Arturia may be doing something similar to that. Um, but check that out. So maybe to get the audio in is just to side chain input. So that allows you to take an audio source and side chain it into an instrument. So see if Arturia has implemented it that way. All right. All right. Uh, so we see also from Ted Springman, uh, wish the envelope shaper was full ADSR. So, um, so a lot of times we could think of it. Um, I'm not sure if there's a different definition of full, uh, but if I wanted to just come over here, we'll listen to the envelope shaper. Take a look at it quickly. Okay, so say I'll take this drum loop here. So go to my inserts. So we can think of this as your attack. Length is decay. You know, so we can think of this as your 
sustain. So if you want to take So I guess it's not, maybe not technically a release, but. But it could still, like, you know, for the intention, it's kind of, you know, um, mimicking a lot of, you know, different workflows for different hardware options that kind of do that for, that people use for mixing. All right. All right, so we have a question um, from De Sigma Bandpa. Um, hi, Greg. I have a question about the MIDI modifiers. Uh, when I lock my piano roll to scale, how do I write the actual notes to the MIDI? If I disable the scale lock, the MIDI notes will be correct. Um, okay, so let's say we'll come over here, take a look at it. So I think I'll have just a quick roads patch here. So let's say. Okay. Um, okay, so it says when I lock my piano roll to scale, how do I write the actual notes in MIDI? Um, so, you know, if you, let's say we come here and I'm in my scale assistant and I want my scale to be. Uh, we'll say C sharp major. Um, so now I'm going to just snap the live input. So, and I'll just make this larger so everyone could see it easily. All right. So now I'm just going to play. So we'll open up our scale assistant again and we'll snap our live input. So as I record in, um, so let's say I'll just come here. Okay. So now the notes that I had played, which was C D, you know, C D E F, or now, uh, so now we could just simply snap, you know, the particular notes to the scale. Uh, if you are drawing in, let's say if we're here. Um, now we could also do snap pitch editing. So if I have my scale chosen as C sharp and I wanted to draw in a D natural, I can't draw in a D natural. And all of the notes, like as I played kind of chromatically up, you know, we could, you know, if I just played kind of within the particular scale, it's going to snap. Or so we could draw our MIDI notes in and it's not going to allow me like I can't I could draw it on a C sharp but not a D because that's not in the scale. And if you wanted to also just uh, enable step input um, at this point, we could just say. OK, so I and I could just double click here, say, OK, I want to put in. Uh, a bunch of notes quickly. And so we have our step input activated and let's say I want to do 16th notes. So now as I play in, so now at this point, it's not going to allow me to play notes that are out of the scale. So I can only input notes that are within the particular scale. So let me know if that's helpful. All right. Um, okay, so we see uh, Patrick just says, Greg, I've sent you a pic of my doubts on Messenger uh, on selecting notes. Can you share us how to do it? So I think in this particular case, what Patrick had sent was... Um, that if we had a bunch of notes. Uh, 
Um, and I think what Patrick had wanted to do from his question that he had uh, sent to me was to select like ev not every third note, but every third note, let's say that's a D4 in this case. So I want to take every third note that's a D4. So let's do this in the MIDI logical editor. So we get to logical editor, get to setup. And in our action, we want to choose select. And we're going to say, we're going to select types are equal to note and value one is, which is the pitch is going to be equal to D four. And we also just want to come over here and further define, and we're going to say context, or we'll say last event. And we'll say uh, every other event. And then I'm just going to put in, let's say, a three. So now what this should do is select every third um, D, D4 note. Let me see if I. Let's do. Maybe context variable. Hang on, let me just. Okay, we'll we'll choose event counter here, and then say three. All right, so now we could select every third D four note. That's that's in the system. So if I wanted to come here, we'll put another D4 note. So now I will just come here and select every third D4 pitch. And we just do it like that. And if we say, okay, I want this to be C4 instead. So that will select every third C4 note, et cetera. So let me know if that's what you're referring to, Patrick. All right, wonderful to have Crocante back from Los Angeles. All right, uh, so we see from Jack C, uh, does Cubase support la touch last control to automatically put the control into automation track? Can't figure out how to draw automation without pressing the play button for third-party plugins. So um, it, it does, and as part of the VST3 specifications, the, a lot of third-party plugins doesn't support it. So, and it's kind of out of our realm if the plugin isn't supporting it. Uh, but let's say if I wanted to come here and let's say I just want to go to um, a particular plugin. So let's say, okay, let's go to Razor. So if I wanted a particular plugin parameter shown, I could just right click and we'll say show release automation track. And that will automatically go and open up that particular function. So if I wanted to come here and show that parameter, now if your plugin doesn't do it, it's it's what the plugin developer has chosen to support and not to support, and you should contact them. But it's part of the VST three specification. So, um, but that's really all you would have to do with a you know, fully VST3 plugin. All right, wonderful to see Tim Weinheimer from Mission Viejo. All right, so we just see uh, from Gadi. Zana, hello, Greg. The controller section uh, and parameter setup button is hidden, hidden or not exciting. Uh, I want to see all the automation parameters to be able to automate via the MIDI CC. Okay. Um, 
Okay, so I'm not sure like if it's within a particular plugin or not. So let's say if I wanted to, um, you know, go to so a lot of you know VST three plugins, we could um, just kind of come over here for. So if you could let me know, um, so when you say and parameter setup function function is hidden or not exciting. Um, so I, I don't know, Gotti, if it's for a plugin, if it's for a track, um, but if you wanted to to be able to automate via, you know, CC data, you know, if you have, you know, quick controls, you know, a lot of parameters, so let's say I wanted to come here to this particular parameter and, you know, you go to, and we could see it if we go to like quick control modes here in Cubase 12. So if I just wanted to learn, you know, a different quick control parameter, I could do this. And now that's going to be controlled by my first quick control setting, uh, my first quick control. Now, if it's, let's say we have a plugin that's going to be uh, set up that has multiple parameters, you know, you could come over here through like the MIDI remote. So let's say like a multi-band compressor. Um, if you go to this little drop down menu and go to uh, the remote control editor, then you could just set up your different banks of controls and be able to you know control all of the parameters that are in the particular plugin and you could assign those to different banks and use those from the generic remote as well if you want but maybe if you could specify a little more that would be helpful for me sorry if i misunderstood all right wonderful to see jeff Zabelski on the live stream Ted Springman's happy because his son came out in LA after all the rain in California recently. <clears throat> all right, uh, so we see, um, hey Greg, question, is there a way to play back audio and listen at one and a half times or two times speed? Okay, so let me just take a particular, we'll jump to, Project here, just okay. So there is a shuttle playback function. So let's say if I wanted to, uh, let's go to my MIDI remote, and I'll just go ahead and assign the particular function. Okay, so let's say I'm here and I want it to assign this button to do that. So I'm going to just double click. And then I think that there is, um, shuttle play like two X. So I'll assign that. And let's say this, I want it to be shuttle play reverse two times, two times speed. So now as I hit these particular, so let's say as we are playing back, so now I hit the buttons. So we could just kind of set it up just like that. And let me just check. So check out like the shuttle play commands and then you could set up, you know, varying degrees of shuttle play. So if we look at our key commands here, so you could do it at halftime, quarter time, one eighth, one time, real time, two, four, or eighth. And then you could also just do that forwards and in reverse. So check out your shuttle play options in the transport. 
You can map key commands for all those. All right, wonderful, <clears throat> wonderful to see Bruce from Simi Valley. Thanks for joining us. All right, so a question from Roey. Uh, hi, how do I mark all the hit points on the grid to do quantization? I understood that in Cubase 12, you can move hit points on a grid. I, I love Cubase 12 Pro. All right. <clears throat> okay, so if we want it to take, um, all right, let me just, Say we'll have our drum part here. So now anytime that Cubase will record um, audio, it's gonna automatically kind of do an analysis of the hit points of the file. So let's say if we come here, we go to, and if we wanted to see them, we could go to our hit points and automatically see our hit points where they fall kind of on the transients. And we could manually add these hit points. Now just for quantizing, uh, we could quantize based on these particular hit points. So if I set my quantize value here to quarter notes, I have this event selected and then hit the letter Q that, you know, we could just come over here and quantize the, you know, the particular events. Let's take a look maybe on the base. So let's say if I'm here, that, you know, just once we have our quantize value, and we have audio warp turned on that I could hit Q and then the audio will be quantized. Now what Cubase 12 is added is we, I could take these particular hit points that have been kind of determined. And if we go to audio to real time processing, we could say, let's create warp markers from the hit points. And sometimes they may not show up until uh, we're gonna activate kind of our warp, free warp, and then let's zoom in a little bit. And now if we needed to manually just kind of add a hit point or to adjust and say, oh, this was a little late, this was early, that we could move these different hit points manually, but it, or move the warp markers manually. But you could quantize, but when you quantize, make sure that you have the audio warp on, and then that would automatically quantize based upon the hit points. And you could refine those, but they're again automatically Calculate it. Okay, so we have a uh, Sandy Hot Fudge from Conway, South Carolina on. Thanks for joining us. Um, all right, so we have a question from Patrick. Um, it says, I map tempo to 120 for Q, and now my chat field just jumped on me. Let me see if I can go back. Okay, uh, so you see, okay, found it. Uh, I mapped a tempo to 120 for a cue, but I have some complicated music, which is not impossible to play in 120 beats per minute. Uh, what can I do, Greg, uh, if I reduce tempo and record it, but it's not playing on time? So if you have a hard time, like, you know, I'm not sure if it's MIDI or audio, um, but let's say it's MIDI, so I'll add, add an instrument track, you know, is, you know, and this is a great, you know, and I see many film composers who are, you know, incredible players that will do this because it's faster. Um, but, you know, let's say you need to do like a 30 second note string run and you're not going to go, you know, let's say that's not, you know, you, you could do it if you spend a lot of time practicing it. But, you know, really what you do is almost get paid to get your different content in so let's say I, I needed to do like a 16th note triplets so i i could just activate the particular uh we'll we'll come over here and set our quantize so we'll say okay i want to put in 16th note triplets 
and I'm going to activate this the uh, step mode where, and you could click and where you see the little blue cursor. So now as I play, So now you can play like a super fast run, just inputting it via step entry. So you could just activate the step entry, set your quantize value. And if you wanted to, as you were doing this, let's say, okay, we activated our step entry and I'm starting here and then hit the arrow key. And that will just move you if you wanted to put a rest in. So the left and right arrow to navigate back. So let's put a couple notes rest. And then that's all you have to do. So if it's for MIDI, just simply uh, come right over there and use step step input mode. And then you can put in like very fast passages. So like when you hear like in action films, there's like amazing string runs that are going on. They're often just put in via step step input, just a faster way of doing it. All right, so a question. Uh, is there any way to do something like a very speed recording uh, where you slow the whole track down, record, and then speed it up to get a weird sound like the Beatles or more recently, Jacob Collier? So yeah, if you wanna do like a very speed recording, um, all you have to do is let's say, I'm going to take all of my tracks here and I'll just revert this because I probably destroyed it. And I'm gonna take all the events and select all the events and put them into musical mode. And now we have an algorithm here. So we could say, okay, I want to go to tape. So not time or pitch. So we're gonna choose an elastique and go to tape. So right now, as I come over here, we could, so I'm at 100 beats a minute, but let's say if I double click and I wanna to go to 92 beats a minute, it's going to slow down and change the pitch like an analog tape machine. So I hit enter. I go to 88. So I could record a new file, send it, you know, at this speed. And then once it has its tempo, I could go back to any other tempo and it's going to automatically speed up and slow down and change the pitch just like an analog tape machine. So that's how you could do very speed recording. So just, you know, put all the tracks that you have in musical mode, uh, switch their algorithm to tape, and then be able to set your tempo, record, and then even if they are recorded at different tempos, they'll all, once they're all in musical mode, will all kind of, you know, raise up or down proportionally. All right, wonderful to have Soren in Sweden. We hope that your new release is going well for you. All right, so we have a question. Uh, what is the best way to do mono track more wide? Uh, put them to the stereo bus? Yeah, so generally most of, like let's say if I want to take this particular track, um, so I have, you know, if I want my bass to be wider. So, you know, one, one easy way of kind of doing this is just to say, okay, I want to add an effects channel. And let's say I just want to go to like an imager. And we'll make the stereo effects channel and I'll just make all these wide and now what I need to do is just come over here and let's get to the sends So 
So without that on. So you can still run it through stereo effects, stereo groups, and then do processing on those or so. All right, wonderful to see Ben Shirley on. Hope you're doing well. All right, so we have Travel Launch that says, am I the only Jamaican in here? So we've had a lot of people from Jamaica on the live streams, but we're so glad you could make it today. All right, and we, so, so wonderful to have Mark Rabin on. We have Val Lee checking in from Vienna. Always want to go there. All right. Okay, so we see um, from Sandy's question, uh, I've lost the images in reverence. How can I get them back and where are the files stored? Um, so I think it's going to be, uh, let's take a look. Um, so if you reinstall the program, it should automatically pop up. So, and this will be slightly different on Mac and PC, but if you go to like your application data folder on Windows, and to do that, um, you just, we'll just find this screenshot of how to, Okay, so let's go to, so if you are, if you're on Windows, go to like your start menu and to all applications and you'll see the user settings data folder. If you're on Mac, what you need to do is go to the library and if you hold down the alter option key, you go to the library and then I think it's gonna be under uh, application support. Let me just switch this view. So let's go to application support and then go to Steinberg. Then I think that there's going to be a VST content. So content, and then one of these, uh, it's probably gonna be under here for, um, or here, I don't know how you can find it. Let's go to your, um, the Steinberg Library Manager, This is probably an easier way to do it. And when we come over to Cubase Nuendo, um, so let's see if it's actually. Okay, so uh, if you go if you go to the VST Library Manager, it's going to actually just be. I think in this particular path. So let's say we go to um, documents VST content. Sorry, I have a tendency to open up my web browser instead of my finder. Okay, so VST content, and then you would probably just see one of these that would say reverence content or impulses. I 
it would be in this folder. Um, and that's where you can find it. But if you reinstall the program, that should automatically reinstall. Let's see, the Loot Mash Pad Shop. So like the Vintage Verb Collection, that's one of them. So it's going to be kind of in this particular area where you could find it. Let's see if it's so, but yeah, look in there, but if you reinstall, then you should automatically reinstall. So just reinstalling the program should allow you to uh, automatically have the reverence impulses reinstalled. All right, so we have Tiago checking in from Brazil. It says he just bought a URRT2, waiting for it to arrive. Hope his vocal recordings will get better. Yeah, it's a wonderful interface with the Rupert Neve Designs Transformer. All right, Ted Springman asks, are they going to release Cubase 13 on the next Friday the 13th? Uh, great for scoring horror movies. So um, I'm not sure if we're going to wait for a Friday the 13th. So I think they'll release Cubase when it's all done. So, But if it happens, you know, I'll, I'll mention that. They did do Cubase 11 on November 11th. So, And I remember someone on the live stream on November 10th telling me that, you know, Steinberg is so stupid missing the, uh, you know, November 11th on the, you know, the 11th of November on the, you know, the 11th day of the 11th month. And I was like, well, today is the 10th. So. Okay. So we have Razel checking in from Denmark. Thanks for joining us. All right. Uh, Mike Rivera asks, uh, can I change the location of my effects track? Want to separate the instrument track location when creating music? Um, so a lot of times, you know, if you want to just physically, like let's say I have this effects track here, you know, we could physically place it wherever we want in a project. Um, when adding an effects channel, you'll get prompted. So let's say... Um, so let's say we add an effects channel. Um, we see this concept of folder setup. So what we should do is create it. If we have create inside folder, this automatically, this effect gets added and automatically placed into our effects channels folder. If I have this track selected and go to add an effects channel track, Let's say we add this and we choose to create outside folder. We can think of create outside folder is below the, the selected track. So now we could just have that effects channel go there. So let me know if that's what you wanted to do in changing it, Mike. All right, so we have a question uh, from Balsa. Uh, Hi, Greg. Any advice or precautions before installing a new version of Cubase regarding saved profiles, presets, preferences, workstations, etc.? cetera? I'll move from Cubase Pro 10.5 to 12. So most of the time, it automatically translates over. It always has for me. Um, if you... You know, if you don't have it transferred, just simply go back to your Cubase 10.5 uh, and uh, go to your profile manager and export your profile and import it. Like when I migrated from my previous MacBook to my current MacBook, so I had an i9, I just took all of 
my I just exported a profile and imported that into here and everything just kind of worked as expected all my presets that I've done over all the live streams are automatically um, automatically carried over so All right, Mike Rivera reminded me to tell everyone to hit the like button and then that allows us to c continue to do these live streams. All right, so we see uh, from Patrick uh, says, yes, Greg, you got, that's exactly what I was saying, but you can show us with tempo map, add tempo track and map uh, tempo fast and slow felt like changing tempo of the video. So let me see if we still have the project open. Okay, so we have this project. All right, so let's watch from the beginning of the video with it turned on. So we'll just get kind of our base point of the video. This is Hamburg, where Steinberg is based. Okay, so now I'm going to add a tempo track. And we'll have the tempo. So you'll see that the video will change lengths as we do this. So, and I'll just do some tempo changes here at the beginning. So now when we play the video, here, let me just, video plays back at the same speed. So the video doesn't, you know, change based on the tempo, but we could have the audio events and MIDI events change based on kind of the same speed of the video itself. So again, the video plays back the same regardless of tempo tracks on or off. So watch it with the tempo track deactivated, same exact speed. So let me know if that makes sense, but all right. All right, uh, so we see from Gadi, uh, latency issue. In the past few weeks, I'm facing with a critical latency, at least four seconds of latency. When I play something from my MIDI controller, I changed the buffer size recently. Not sure if it's related to that. So, you know, first thing I would do is always kind of check the buffer size, um, you know, and we could do that, you know, the lower the buffer, uh, the more responsive the system, but the harder that the computer works, so right now I have my buffer set to 512, um, but excuse, excuse me, let me clear my throat. But if you, uh, one other thing it could be is if you have a lot of plugins on your project, especially like, let's say if you go to your master bus and you have, you know, lots of plugins going on, like, you know, different mastering type plugins you know the tax we can think of the tax of those plugins like what the cost is is the cost of those plugins is latency so if i wanted to come over here we can say okay i wanted to add uh let's say some multi-band compressors here so as we want to work with this, we could just say, let's get to dynamics and I'll just add another one. So every time that we add plugins in an existing project, those are gonna cause latency. And if we go to kind of our, if we hit F3 and go to the setup, we could actually see kind of the channel latency. So we see just adding those two plugins added 246.1 milliseconds. Um, now, if you wanted to, you know, instead of going through your whole project and deactivating plugins that are causing latency, 
we can click on this little button here in the bottom left hand corner called constrain delay compensation. So with this, what we could do is this, once this is activated and illuminated to this orange color, that is bypassing the plugins that are causing latency. So try, you know, if you've lowered your buffer, um, try just to come over here and activate the constrained delay compensation function, and that'll probably fix it for you. Um, so we see a question from Jeff Sabelski. Greg, do you know if Klaus uh, Bedelt, uh, or Badelt used Cubase at all for Pirates of the Caribbean, The Curse of the Black Pearl, which I'm playing oboe one now for a symphony concert soon? Uh, you probably know his hands. Um, so I'm not sure if, if I'm not familiar if he, if that, if he is a Cubase user or not. So I, I can't really speak for that, sorry. All right, so Michael Teams from Weatherford, Texas is on, so wonderful to see him, and I believe the virtual ice cream will begin. All right, and we see Peter from Montreal, Uno Memento from Finland. All right, and we see that Jeff Zabelski is thumbs up number 44, so. All right, so we see uh, from question, um, what's the best way to humanize the timing and velocity to a perfectly quantized MIDI drum track? Okay, so let's just go ahead and create one quickly. So there are random functions in the uh, MIDI modifiers. So let's say if I'm here, All right, I'll just do like horribly bad MIDI drum part here. Okay, so, so I'll just put this on a one measure. All right, so say, okay, we'll just do like some really All right, I'm just gonna turn off select that preference for auto select events under cursor. Okay, so let's say, let make sure it's off. Okay, so as I, now I just wanted to come over. Um, so let's say we have this perfectly quantized part. So let's get to your MIDI modifiers. And then there are, let's say, okay, I want to randomize the position. Um, so we could just say, so we could say, okay, I want a minimum value or maximum and minimum values for that. And then we could say, okay, I want to randomize um, velocity. So we could just say, okay, now we'll go to random target two. And then we could. So say between 107 and 50. 
Now, if you don't, so you could play around with it there, but you could also just come and, okay, so let's say we'll bypass those, but let's go into like our MIDI logical editor. So as we look at our particular pattern here, we could go to our MIDI logical editor And let's say I just want, so we'll say we're gonna transform notes. And then we could say, I want to, um, let's take the position and set two random values. Okay, so we'll take, I'm sorry, we'll just take this. And now what we want to do is to take our position and set two random values here. So say minus 20, 20, and apply. Now we could also just Say, okay, instead of randomizing the position, let's randomize the velocity. So I'll just say we'll go to value two. And we want to set to random values between 80 and 120. So now we hit apply. So if we wanted to look at the velocity, Now, if we wanted to also just say, I want to take, um, we could also say, I want to take the uh, type is equal to notes and let's say F sharp one. So we'll say value one, which is pitch is equal to F sharp one. Then we could say, okay, I want to take, um, and we'll say, okay, let's do our last event. And we'll say every other event. And we'll say event counter. So we'll say every other hi-hat note. We want to take value two and subtract 40. So at this point, I could take every other hi-hat. And, and so if we look at it here for my hi-hats, where we have this kind of playing, I could just say, let's so all sorts of great stuff you could do to kind of randomize velocity, randomize every third snare hit, you know, velocity or position. So we could do stuff like that pretty easily. So either using the uh, MIDI modifiers, and if you don't see the MIDI modifiers in the list, you might have to right click and just make sure that MIDI modifiers is active there. All right, I see Michael Teams is doing his virtual ice cream distribution, it's wonderful. All right, we see from uh, just comment, thanks for the automation info, it makes increasing volume so much easier. And I'm in Detroit, so thanks for joining us today. All right, we have Alex joining us from Azerbaijan. I'm sure I pronounced that wrong. All right, and we have Westar, Westar, he's on. All right, uh, so we have a question. Uh, is one shot available in a sampler track for drums 808s? So let's come over here. I just want to find. Let's say kick drum.
Okay, so let's go ahead, right click, and we'll make this into a sampler track. So really for one shot mode, all you have to do is just activate right here. And now um, that will, you could just have that kind of automatically just do be in one shot mode. So we see that it almost looks like a target with a, so just simply turn that on right there and then you could be in one shot mode. So it's available. All right, um, so we see from Patrick uh, asking Greg, can you tell the Cubase team to add some extra time on audio retrospective recording because we usually sing something comes accidentally, so it's better to add extra time to audio. So you can, you could do up to one minute, I think. So if we come to our preferences, um, you know, we could just simply at this point, um, Let's just say, okay, we want to go to uh, record to audio. And then you will see your audio pre recorded in seconds. So we can go up to 60 seconds there. Um, and if you need beyond 60 seconds, you could always do kind of the classic engineer trick. Always, you know, like Phil Ramon was was wonderful at this. He was always had like a, a DAT machine or like a different recorder going on. Um, so when someone's like, oh, I sang the best part ever, it's like, okay, let's go back and listen to it. And it's like, no, it wasn't that good actually, you know? So, um, but yeah, you could do up to 60 seconds for your pre-record. So probably should be enough. All right. Wonderful. David M could make it from Liverpool. Hope you're enjoying your wave lab. All right. And great to see Gareth on from Spain as well as Nick. All right, so a question. Uh, hi, Greg. After importing all audio files to new project, what is the best way for Cubase Pro to... Pro What's the best way in Cubase 12 to quickly adjust gain structure in all the tracks and make adjustments uh, so I have proper headroom? So what I would probably do is let's say, okay, I was doing a new project and I just will come over here and let's insert um, a bunch of tracks and I wanted to quickly do a, a gain staging. So I will just say, okay, let's import um, audio files. Right, and we'll go to our audio folder here. So let's say, okay, I just want to take um, okay. So let's say I'm I just want to take all of these tracks, come over here. Well, I'll import these to different tracks. So let's say we have uh, this going on. I would, and I'm. This may sound sound nonsensical, but let's say as we're kind of playing, go to the mix console and you could just right click on kind of an empty fader area and we could change. So when we go to our meter settings is come over here and you could do like an input metering. So if I was looking at this, I would say, okay, maybe I want like this track isn't coming through as well. And I could just kind of look at and eyeball the particular tracks and kind of, you know, adjust their gain based on the signal that's coming into the track as opposed to any processing that's going on. So again, you know, maybe if you want to go to your uh, meter settings and then you will see your meter position. Change that to input, and then you can see exactly what's coming in from the track and adjust the faders pretty quickly like that.
Okay, Chatfield jumped on me, so finding my spot. All right, well, great to see Vinny Sabatino from Orlando, Florida on the live stream. All right, we see that Mark Rabin's dog Stella says hi and woof to everyone on the live stream. All right. Um, All right, so uh, we have a question. Can you explain the spectral layer function inside of Cubase? So what spectral layers is, you know, when we do audio editing, we often see, um, you know, our audio here where we could do edits. And if I do, you know, cut out a part, or we do processing that we actually do processing on all of the frequencies. Now what's, you know, so this is all the frequencies and I'm kind of taking the entire, you know, spectral landscape of the particular file and doing edits. What spectral layers is going to allow us to do is to, when we run it as an extension, we could now double click and we see that we could do edits only on specific frequency ranges. So if we kind of drag um, this down, we'll just come over here. We can see our standard waveform, but what we're kind of looking at here is more kind of like our low frequencies, our high mid range, our highs, and kind of, you know, generally harmonic overtones. So if we had particular edits, like let's say here, the, the bass, you know, the bass drum pedal squeaked, you know, at this point, what we could do instead of taking out the entire frequency range, I could just say, I just want to get rid of this, or we could just kind of grab, you know, do processing uh, on particular frequency. So I could say, oh, I just wanted to kind of get rid of that. This is, you know, someone coughed right here in the middle of a wonderful live concert. So we could just kind of zoom in and say, Okay, I want to select a particular uh, range here and say, okay, I just want to take this cough and be able to delete, you know, like particular selections. So if I just hit delete, so this way I'm not editing all of the frequencies, but just very specific frequencies. So that's what spectral layers is going to allow you to do is kind of uh, just to have actual uh, frequency kind of independent editing and processing of your audio. So you could also use it to extract vocals from a recording if you have, you know, and that's the version that comes with Cubase, or if you wanted to um, extract, diff you know, different in instruments like the drums, the bass, the keys, the vocals, you could do that in Spectral Layers Pro. So if you want to do unmixing, it's also wonderful for that. All right, so you see Patrick just saying, uh, Greg, I was talking about the picture, which I just sent you now. So um, I don't really have an easy way of kind of checking out like, you know, Facebook messages during uh, the live stream. So, um, but if we, I could comment on it for Tuesday's live stream. Sorry about that. It's just a lot to juggle with two different computers going on. Okay, reading through comments. Okay, so we see, um, how do I delete an insert? Uh, I don't have an option like clear send is dragging out the only option. So let's say if I have an insert here So one way is to just drag it out. Another way is to go to that particular send here uh, and just choose no effect. So either um, 
dragging. Or click kind of right here and choose no effect. So those are two ways to get rid of the insert. Um, now let's see, there may be another. Yeah, so those are kind of two ways. So let me know if that makes sense, but you could just choose no effect. Dragging is makes you feel cooler. All right, so we have a question. Um, how to set the default sends for effects? Um, so really, if you wanted to, let's say if we have all these tracks, um, you know, like effect sends are kind of dynamic, so they're not so fixed. Uh, but if you wanted to come over here, so let's say we go to our effect sends, I could select all the tracks and activate Q-Link. And then I can say, okay, for here, I want uh, to right click and then we could add an effects end. So let's say, okay, I want room works on. This one, let me just. So now we can say, okay, I want room works on this one. I wanted to add a delay. So that way I could have these automatically fixed across different tracks. But, you know, if you wanted to say, okay, in this track, I wanted um, the delay to be the very top one and the reverb to be the second, I could just switch and say, okay, I want my, and let me just undo that. Um, so say I want, you know, the, so I'll turn off quick link and let's say on this channel, I want the delay first and then this end, we could change that. So if you just select all the tracks and then just, you know, activate Q link and, and activate the send across, then that will automatically um, be carried over for you. So you could have it fixed if you wanted to and you could save that within a template as your startup template. All right, so we see from uh, Roby M. Be Becky. Um, Greg, a thing I've been experiencing lately with Cubase is that it stops responding when I try to change the sample rate on my Zoom Live Track 12. Uh, Cubase 12.052 Pro didn't have the issue pre update. Um, so check if you're going into, um, usually it's kind of. You know, it's not an issue to do that, but it, there could be clock settings. Um, so if we come over here, um, and let me just, so if we go to your studio setup, see if you have uh, anything set for, like, you know, if it's externally clocked, if that is checked, um, or if you have a different clock source, like if you have a digital input, um, but make sure that, and also within the unit, make sure that the unit itself is always set to follow the sample rate. Um, sometimes the units themselves will kind of lock to a particular sample rate and won't respond directly to the sample rates depending on the interface itself. Some you have to, like if you have a Dante virtual sound card and you switch from 48K to 44.1, you have to kind of jump through a lot of hoops and it's just how the Dante virtual sound card works. Whereas other interfaces will automatically follow whatever you set in Cubase, some won't. But if you have it like externally clocked for any reason, 
uh, check to see that you don't have it set for external clock or you don't have the zoom set to look for external clock, especially if you have a digital input. See, Gareth says, uh, trying to please please listeners unless you're doing production library music. For There's no point trying to please listeners unless you're doing production library music. And that Gareth just mentions that you have to be yourself musically. No point trying to be anyone else. They are, they're already it. So it's a great point. Yeah. I always tell people be themselves. Everyone else is be yourself because everyone else is taken. All right, so I see, uh, yeah, Michael Teams, I got your uh, the project yesterday downloaded. So I emailed you a quick question on it. So, uh, but yeah, hopefully over the weekend, I'll get some time to work up a base part for you. Gareth is mentioning his great artist discovery of the week is Church of the Cosmic Skull. So. All right, so we see from uh, Patrick, says, his question is, uh, Greg, I have three MIDI tracks, piano, bass, strings. Uh, now I, I control, select all three tracks. I want to make piano bass notes to bass track, piano chords to be moved to strings uh, inside key editor, is it possible? So, all right, so let's go ahead. Let me find something with some piano in it. All right, so I'm going to add, let's say, two instrument tracks, and I'll just. All right, so what I want to do is kind of copy these notes from this piano part into these. So, all right. Just look for one. Okay. All right. So we have um, our three parts. So we could just kind of navigate to different parts. Um, and then we could just say, I just want to edit the active part. So let's say, okay, I want to take these notes. And I want these for the base. I'm going to copy. So let's say, okay, now. Here, let me just say so we want this. All right, so let me, I'll just start with the piano.
So I'm just going to hit control command control or command plus C and let's come over and let me just first, I'm just going to choose my color scheme here. Um, to part. Okay. So let's come over here to base and paste. So, or let me just alt V and let's say I wanted to copy these to strings. So let's say from my piano part, I'm going to select this copy and let's come over here to our string pattern and alt V again. So now that when we look at this, we'll have our baseline and then our string. So all you have to do is kind of cut, copy, paste. Uh, and then if you want to paste that origin instead of control or, or command plus V, hit alt or option plus V. So that way you could kind of do like orchestration from a piano part. So let me know if that makes sense. Okay, so I just saw Michael Team's email come in, so I'll read it after the live stream. All right. All right, so we just see uh, from Jack C says, for automation, I don't think it's the third party development VST3 issued in regards to the last touch parameter in Studio One in Ableton. It works perfectly to automate the touch parameter. Any chance it will be developed in Cubase as well. So, you know, um, we may be, you know, so I don't think that those companies are utilizing the VST3 function to do that. So I'll make sure to mention it to our team again, but, you know, it's really, when it doesn't work, it's because that particular function, that's how Steinberg is implementing it as part of the VST3 specification and to utilize that functionality. So um, when the plugins don't support it, that's when you don't see it. And other plugins probably don't utilize the VST3 specification to do that particular function, but I'll mention it to the team again. But I'll, you know, make sure that you mention it to your plugin developer companies. All right, so you just see from Roby, he says, uh, sometimes Cubase crashes so hard it tells me I can't find a license on my device, which is a bummer because I bought it and kind of makes me question myself at times. So if it can't find a license, just make sure when you go into your activation manager, one, that you're signed in. Uh, but sometimes, you know, if if you can figure out, you know, when you open up Cubase again, often you'll get a message saying this plugin caused a crash. If it was a plugin that caused it, sometimes you'll see that it will automatically indicate that particular plugins caused a crash. Um, so often it's going to be, you know, the vast majority of times it's going to be related to kind of a third party plugin, but you know, you can see, uh, overall it runs very stably. So Patrick just says, uh, Greg, I'm planning to release my songs on YouTube. What's your thoughts? Um, so probably if I was releasing music, I would do it on every platform. Uh, I would do it on YouTube is obviously kind of very, uh, I'm not sure which is best for the artist. You know, if it's one one thousandth of a penny versus two one thousandths of a penny per stream, you know, but I think uh, all there's a lot of great resources that people could hear your music. Uh, I think, you know, I obviously do a lot of stuff on YouTube. I learn tremendous things, you know, not just about music, but, you know, whenever I'm looking to research anything, I look on YouTube. 
Uh, I my the music service I personally subscribe to is Amazon Music, so it could play on my Echo devices and play kind of anywhere very easily. Um, but you know, Spotify is obviously very and Apple Music are obviously very popular as well. So I would you know I I think a lot of services will automatically populate all the different uh, distribution formats and see which one you get more revenue from. Chatfield jumps, so I'm just trying to jump back. So lots of questions in my future here. So All right, so we see a uh, question um, from Mike Raffone. Um, uh, so it says, hi, does it make a difference for mixing if the track is stereo or mono? When I render uh, MIDI drums, it always ends up stereo, but the drums audio recorded are normally in mono. So you, generally not. It's not really going to make a, a difference, but realize that, you know, if you're sending it to a stereo out for processing, like, you know, a lot of times when you do MIDI drums, you may, like in Groove Agent, you may have a, you know, one mic uh, that cat, you know, like a close mic, and then you may have room mics that are stereo, overhead mics that are stereo, and those are captured. So that's why it's going to be rendered because the sound you're hearing is going stereo. So that's why it's, you know, it's often going to be rendered as stereo. So you're not going to lose anything of your mono punch or anything like that, having it in stereo. Wonderful to see Pablo on from Galicia, España. Glad you could make it. So we have the whole hot mess group on. Glad you could make it today. Always better when Pablo is on. And Gareth is all excited. All right. Let me see. I guess Pablo liked the bass line, so I'm glad it worked out. Thanks for sending over the tracks. David M. says, the more I listen, the more I realize I know nothing. So it's always great to be able to learn. So I learned something new on every live stream, I think. So. All right, so we have Frederick ask from Montreal, Canada, can I place an EQ in one specific section without touching the rest of the track? Um, so let's say I wanted to do, I was listening to this. And I want to do like an AM radio type of EQ effect on just one part. So what you could do is just grab the range selection tool and select what you want to do. You could hit F7 by default, and that will bring you to like, you know, the direct offline processing. But you could also just go to audio and let's say go to plugins. And let's say, okay, I want to go to EQ. So I want to go to my studio EQ. And what I want to do is just come over here let's go to a preset so I think that there's like phone or AM radio type preset here so let's say I just want to do um, So telephone. So what I want to do, I'm going to select 
the telephone preset. And what this has done is it's automatically processed that particular line. So now it's just that one particular section that we selected. And then when it leaves that section, it will just kind of come right over here. Then we'll be right back. So it's only done what we selected. So if I want to come here and do the same, you know, so whatever that we want to do, we could just say, okay, let's again come over here and, you know, go to our Studio EQ. So that's how you can do it. So again, just kind of select what you want to do. You don't have to do any fancy automation. Go to your audio, to plugins or direct offline processing, choose an EQ, and then you could just do your processing. And the beauty of this is if you did like 14 processes, even after saving the project, we'll come right over here and I'll just delete all the processes and you're right back to where you were. Okay. All right, read through comments. All right, uh, so we just had a question. Um, could you explain the algorithms one by one for me? Okay, so when we have an audio file and, we, and we're doing like real time time stretching that there, there are different algorithms. So these are standard and are uh, more legacy uh, around for legacy compatibility with earlier versions, I think starting with Cubase 3. Um, and then probably the more popular ones are Elastique. So there's three different families to choose from in three different kind of versions. So one is going to be the efficient. If you have a slow CPU or you need to stretch, you know, 3,000 tracks and change the tempo on the fly all at once, you could use Elastique Efficient. Um, there's also Elastique Pro and Elastique Formant. So formant, I would use like if you wanted to raise the pitch of material without having kind of uh, like the formant sounding. So, you know, we often call this like a kind of, a, you know, a munchkin effect or where you're taking a particular voice and making it more, uh, maybe making it sound more female from a male vocal or vice versa. We could, you know... So if you wanted to kind of maintain the kind of the uh, tonal characteristic of the overtones of the voice, you could preserve the formants. And then the most popular are going to be just the regular Elastic Pro. So we could think of this, the top three is regular formant preservations. I better suit it for like more complex pitch material. And then this would be maybe a little bit lower quality, but more efficient if you're doing larger projects. Now within each of these three, there are three different types. There's time, and we can think of time as being more for rhythmic components, drums, maybe a rhythm guitar part, like a chunky, chunky guitar part. Uh, and we can think of pitch as being maybe more for like if you're doing acoustic guitar, if you're doing piano, if you have audio and vocals. And then we also have tape. And what tape is going to do is as we slow down or speed up a file, like real time playback on a track, the pitch, when we're in tape, the pitch will increase, will rise as the tape is sped, as the, as the tempo is increased. And the pitch will decrease as the tempo 
is lowered just like an analog tape machine like we showed earlier. So um, those are kind of the different algorithms for that. Reading through comments. All right. Um, so we see Peter says, I downloaded Greg's uh, MLE, MIDI logical editor, project logical editor, macros, presets from the Cubase Nation Discord. Where do I place them? So if you go into, let's say, your project window, um, you would just go to like your project logical editor. So let's say we go here and we do the same thing for the MIDI logical editor. Uh, and then if you go to show user presets location, and at that point you could just find a folder for your logical editor and um, project logical editor presets directly here. So you could just copy the logical editor presets into the logical uh, into the logical edit, edit folder and the project logical editor presets into this folder for the um, you know and just like we showed before how to get into let's see if we still have it open we don't but um, if we wanted to go to You know, your Cubase Windows settings here. So if we go to, on Windows, go to your Start menu, go to All Programs, the Cubase 12, go to the, your User Settings Data folder. Or if you go to Mac, um, come over here to your Library, and you can see the Library if you hit the, the Alt or Option key. Um, and then when you go into uh, Preferences, you'll see a presets folder under like Cubase 12. So we'll see presets. And then here you'll see key commands. And then under the presets folder, you can see the key commands and just drop the key, the key commands.xml file right there. And then you should be good to go and have access to them. All right, so we see a question. Uh, how do you stretch positions of MIDI notes uh, in the MIDI editor, not in the logical editor, similar to time handles and other programs? So if you want to just come over here. You know, so if you wanted to make notes longer or shorter, um, you could just kind of just change the length like so. Um, if you're on, let's say, you know, on the project window, you could even come over here. So let's say uh, I have this and let's say we switch the uh, sizing applies time stretch. So now if I double click and we look at, let's say all my MIDI notes laid out for me here, if I now grab the edge, I could just do a time stretching directly on the project window. And since those are in sync, you could, you know, very easily just say, okay, I want that longer, shorter. I want this to start earlier. So we could do your time stretching in MIDI just directly on a project window as well. All right, so we have uh, Troca saying, hi, Greg, uh, from Porto. Uh, a question, what are, what are the steps I got to be sure I do to get Cubase to be MIDI clock synced externally uh, by a boss uh, RC600? I'm struggling with that. 
Okay, so what you want to do is to have Cubase be uh, the master. Um, so I know some people, you know, want to take like a drum machine and have that be the master over MIDI clock to Cubase, but the MIDI clock isn't anywhere near the resolution enough to properly sync digital audio. So what you need to do is to have Cubase be the master when doing MIDI clock. So let's go to your transport and let's go to project synchronization setup and we want to go to destination. So we'll see our MIDI clock destination. So wherever this particular file, um, wherever your boss unit is connected to MIDI interface wise, just simply check that. Um, and now all you have to do is to make sure when you go to the transport that external sync is active and hit play in Cubase and then your boss, you want to set that to uh, look for incoming MIDI clock and then when you hit play in Cubase, your your boss unit will play. But you know, because the MIDI clock resolution is nowhere near accurate enough or precise enough uh, and changes based on the tempo, the digital audio won't properly synchronize. Um, so that's why Cubase would need to be the master. See Jeff Zabelski just saying, rest in peace to David Crosby. So yeah, that was kind of a sad loss. Also with Jeff Beck a couple weeks ago, it was very unexpected. All right, so we have a question. Um, how to easily convert 24-bit 48K to 16-bit 44.1? Thanks. Okay, so really all you have to do is if you go into the media and let's go to the pool window, you could select uh, your file, right click, and then you'll see, um, I think it's convert files. And here you could change to different sample rates and bit depths. So once you are, uh, you could just go directly to the audio pool and right click and just choose convert files. So if you need to do one file, uh, that's that's a fast, easy way to do it. And if you needed to do a whole project, you would just come to your project setup under your project menu or hit shift plus the letter S and change your sample rate here. And then that could prompt you for changing all multiple files in a project at once. All right, so we have a question. Um, I know this has nothing to do with Cubase, but it's an audio interface issue. Basically, when I plug my headphones into the interface, it duplicates both ears panning and plays in both ears. Any idea how to fix it? Um, so, you know, make sure that when you're plugging it in, you know, there are different connectors. So, like, you know, you'll see that there is a, you know, like a tip ring sleeve headphone connector and there's also just a tip sleeve uh you know i think it's just a tip sleeve where it's only going to really you know where you need kind of three audio cables or three connections so it could be if you have a, an adapter that the adapter is causing it um so if you want to hear um so so that could be causing it um but um So yeah, I, I and I just see your further comment. Well, my headphones have the small male end. I need to use an adapter. Is it the adapter's issue then? So it, there's a good chance that it is the adapter. So you should see almost like a little ring going around um, on it. So make sure that you're going into a stereo quarter inch and not a mono quarter inch. See, Tim Weinheimer is getting virtually fat from all the virtual ice cream. So it's the best kind. You don't have to go to the gym or work out or exercise. Get it off. 
and you get free Cubase knowledge on top. All right, so we just see, uh, how can I change the master tempo with instruments and audio settings in sync? Okay, so really all you would, so let's say if we have, um, like all, of, let's say we have this particular file and like my vocal, and I'll just revert this, because I've probably I've musically destroyed it. All right, so let's say uh, right now I'm at 75 beats a minute. If your audio file is set to musical mode, so it knows kind of what the tempo is of the original file. So let's come over here to our pool window. We can say, okay, this uh, vocal file was recorded at 75 beats a minute and it is in musical mode. And we could also look at it directly here for musical mode. So let's say uh, we have all of our MIDI tracks and these MIDI tracks by default are set into musical mode. So once I come over here, I'll just type in a new tempo. So let's say 85 beats a minute. Let's say 100. So you could have one track that's probably this drum loop that's not in musical mode. So, but that's all you had to do is kind of place all the tracks uh, into musical mode. So let's say if I just want to take these, put them into musical mode. Um, then that would be all you'd have to do. And then whatever those tracks would immediately then follow the tempo that's from the tempo track or from the particular uh, metronome setting that you have. All right, we see Jean-Marie needs his ice cream. Wonderful to see you on, buddy. Hope you're doing well. All right, so we have HA checking in from Ghent in Belgium. Thanks for being online. All right, great to see Sable Winters on the live stream. All right, so we see from Marie Starr, uh, please, how do I solve problems of audio dropout? I've done everything possible, but yet it's the same and even getting worse. Um, so, uh, you know, if you're running a Windows, you know, so the first thing to do, obviously, is to, you know, raise the buffer. So if you go to your audio interface, increase the buffer size. Uh, a lot of times audio dropouts can be caused by different components in uh, the operating, you know, in your Computer. So if you're running Windows, there's a really handy utility called uh, from a company called Resplendence, and it's called Latency Mon, and that could determine if you have different components in your computer, which are causing uh, like interrupts to audio performance. So sometimes what happens is you may be just kind of playing, and then the video card just says, "Hey, I need attention. You know, look over here, look over here," and as it does that. Um, you know, the video card can cause the audio system to kind of drop out or a network card. So a lot of times it's going to be video display, especially if you have like an NVIDIA driver. 
where you want to not install any of the gaming features. You just want like the basic driver. So, um, so check out like you know latency mon by Resplendence Systems. All right, so we see uh, from, I think, Sonki, uh, Sonk. Uh, Hi, Mr. Cubase, just got myself Artist Edition. Great that you do community events. So welcome to the Steinberg family, and we hope to see you on many live streams so we could help you get the most out of your system. And welcome to the community. Thanks for joining us. All right, um, so we see a question from Jack C. Uh, can you do adaptive project duration or is it only set to the timing as it is in the project setup? Um, so I'm not sure if, if there is, maybe if you could, um, so you have the project set up and you could set kind of the, uh, du you know, the project duration uh, directly, you know, inside of here so you said like this is set for 10 minutes but you could you know increase or decrease that so if you start off with 10 minutes and you want to go to 23 hours and 59 minutes you could change it at any time and then go back to six minutes um so let me know if there's a particular need to have a kind of an adaptive project duration so Reading through comments here. All right, so I just see, um, how do I set a groove from like an 808 to a kick track on a single note? Um, All right, um, all right, so I'm just, how do I set a groove uh, like an 808 uh, to a kick track on a single note? Um, so I'm not sure if you want to, uh, if the 808 is like a loop with like multiple parts, um, but let's see if I could, create something here and maybe you could if i'm totally not understanding just let me know all right so let's come over here let's do a couple loops all right let me just All right. Um, okay, so let's say let's say this is our um, set of groove from in like an eight oh eight to a kick track on a single note. Um, so let's say if I wanted to take uh, let's just find maybe a kick. See if we have.
All right, so if you had like a particular tempo, like a feel for this, like one of the things you could do is come over to hit points. And let's say if we, um, we just want to adjust kind of the threshold here for this, and we could say create groove quantize. So now this is a quantize preset. So if I wanted to edit kind of the feel of this based on this groove, you know, we could just quantize the particular event based on particular grooves if you wanted to. But let me know if the 808 is like a loop or if it's just a single kick sample and what, you know, um, so that would be helpful for me. See, Valley says, dragging makes you feel cooler. Indeed, Greg, indeed, he says. All right. Um, so we see, does Cubase have an FM synth? So there's not an FM synth. We have virtual analog. We have granular. But there are lots of uh, FM synth sounds. Uh, so if you wanted to go into... Uh, obviously, Steinberg is part of the Yamaha family. So if you kind of go through... Uh, a lot of the Howling in Sonic SE presets, you could kind of have classic uh, DX7, you know, FM synth sounds that kind of come uh, as part of this, but there's no, like, you know, it's more of a sample, like a rompler playback. But there could be some interesting FM stuff coming in the near future. So we'll have to see. Hint, hint. All right, so we have a question. Uh, is there a way to move from measure to measure using a key command? So I want to say it's like, um, yeah, if you hit uh, control or command, um, and then I have my grid set to bar. So if I have the, and so what I'm going to do is hit the, on the numeric keypad. I want to, so now if I hit the plus sign, I go forward by beat. If I hit the minus sign, I go back. By beat, if my grid is set to bar, now I could just navigate. So again, control plus the plus sign on the numeric keypad or the minus sign. So plus to go forward, minus to go backwards. So you could just do that and be able to navigate very quickly. And it's based on your grid. So if you want it to be by seconds or milliseconds, you could do that as well. All right, so we have Milena Del Torto from Brewster, New York. Thanks for being on with us. All right, so Filter Freak is on, so thanks for joining us. And don't worry about being late. The only, only, only punishment is you have to hit the like button immediately. And we see Gerald Eagley from Martinez, California. And of course, my, all right. Michael Teams wants people to smash the like button. All right, so we see uh, from Tim Weinheimer, uh, in Cubase 12, uh, you see next to third party plug in the instrument or effect three lines uh, after it, uh, it is VST. I think that's right if Greg, uh, yeah, so that is correct. So when you see, um, like particular, let's say we go to add an instrument track and we see the list where we see these three little hashtags that's indicating that it is a VST3 instrument or a VST3 plugin. So if we wanted to add an effects channel, 
we would see all of the different three hashtags here, which are VST3 plugins. So whether it's third party or Steinberg plugins. All right, so we see a uh, question from Rohan. Um, Rohan Pommel, Pommel's um, um, question is, can I import files from my old BR8 digital recording into Cubase uh, 12 Pro? So, you know, if the audio files, a lot of times, like, you know, I think that's like a little standalone hard disk recorder. Um, if it has a removable media, like, I don't know if there's like a removable drive or or if you could carry all the files over to like a USB flash drive, you could take those files and import them. Most of the most recorders these days will have timestamps. So if you recorded eight tracks, you could then drop it into Cubase. And um, if you had like a particular, um, you know, you could import all of the files and drag it uh, over and if you go to edit and choose move to you could say move to origin and that would place it at the timestamp position but the recorder has to actually do that um, so a lot of times the limitations is in the recorders themselves because they want you to stay in that particular environment or ecosystem so you do everything there so sometimes they're not really designed to be taken out, but you know, if you could get the files out via like a USB flash drive, you could copy them into Cubase and, uh, but there's may not be, you know, and import all the files, take them to, di you know, different tracks. So if we come to our file menu and we choose import audio files, we could select a number of files, um, and then we say, okay, import them to different tracks. And now what we could do is just say, okay, uh, all these tracks, let's say are here. And I want these tracks um, to move to origin. So again, just go to edit, move to origin. And then that would move them to their actual timestamp positions. So you could give that a try. See, Gerald Ely says the telephone EQ preset that's new to me. So we'll give you that feature free for showing up today. All right, so we have a question. Um, is there a specific use for direct routing function that is unique with uh, comparison to usual sends? Thank you. I uh, very appreciate these hangouts. You know, so we could think of the, you know, when we have an audio track, um, you know, we could, and let's say we have a number of group tracks. Okay, so I'll just add some groups. Okay, so let's say we'll come over to our particular channel and we'll add direct send. So, you know, if we have, you know, so sometimes people may not want to, so let's say we have our audio here and we have an effect send. So I'm just gonna come over here to, let's say our destination. So let's say I have a number of effect sends here. Um, and you realize that these are kind of going out parallel in parallel path. So, uh, so if we wanted to add, sorry, let me just come here, add in our effects channel. Let's add a reverb. Okay, so our effects channel, you know, now these are going out 
to so we may have like you know eight effect sends, but maybe we want to send this to two or three different groups for parallel processing. So sometimes when we do this, we could you know have different amounts of the signal going out, and some people could argue that that's not a true parallel processing. So I could go to my direct routing, and I could still be able to route to multiple groups. Um, so let's say if I wanted to, you know, take this particular track and send it to all of my different groups, and I will come over and just switch one little preference here where we could do our direct routing summing mode. So now um, I could kind of do more, a lot more extensive parallel processing with this using direct routing. And we could also automate direct routing on and off. So we don't necessarily have to use all of our effect sends for multiple groups. We have again, multiple groups that could be accessed directly from direct routing and still have eight effect sends. So, um, so it gives you a lot more flexibility overall. All right. Okay, just reading through comments. Thanks for all the wonderful questions. And again, if you've learned something, make sure you hit the like button. I see that we're at 105 already. So I'm about 20 minutes behind, it looks like. I'm trying to catch up. All right, um, so I just see, how can I listen to the reverb independently of the voice, for example, to process it or equalize it better? Okay, so let's say I wanted to, we'll get to, Beatles or Stones, we haven't played this one in a while. Okay, so let's say I want to be able to isolate the reverb. So often when we solo the reverb, it's gonna actually solo the particular sources that are feeding it as well, which makes sense. Um, so let's come over here and just say, okay, now we want to take, uh, so we'll slide over to, All right, so now when we solo the return, we see that it's also gonna solo the source that's feeding it. So if I, what we want to do is to act, make sure that we have the control room activated. So let's go to your studio menu to audio connections, make sure that the control room is turned on. And we want to basically set, uh, we add, right click, add a monitor, and then we're gonna use the HS, so I just labeled as HS, this is where, what I'm listening to. And on my outputs, I had a stereo out, but I chose to not have it connected. So that, um, so now this gives us control over what we call the listen bus. So when we actually go to listen to a particular source I'll go to my control room so instead of like soloing both the source and the material what we can do now is just click on the L and I'll just so as soon as I just come here So now I could just dim, or if I adjust the dim level down, now I'm only hearing the actual 
reverb. Not with the source. Just leave it alone. So again, just click on. You still love when I played Hey Jude. So again, just instead of solo. I should have told you I was So now that's just the reverb isolated. I'll just set this to. So and again, I could adjust my listen down. So that, that's only the reverb. So if I go to, that's only the reverb that's being used on the drums. Solo includes the source. So you use the listen bus and then you could just isolate the particular uh, effect by itself for tweaking and EQing and do other processing as you need it. All right, so Bruce has to take off. So thanks for being with us today. And we'll see you on Tuesday's live stream, hopefully. All right, wonderful to see Graham Witcher from Royal Wooten Bassett. Thanks for joining us. Hope that you're settling into your new home. See, Jeff Sabelski just mentioned uh, Jeff Beck inspired him to buy his black 76 Strat. I saw him in Oakland Stadium in about 1977. He threw his white Strat across the stage. After the first song, swore at it and grabbed another one and all was well. So yeah, I got to uh, meet him. Um, I was on the crew for the 2007 Eric Clapton's Crossroads in Chicago and he played there and you know, he was phenomenal. I felt bad for Eric Clapton who had to follow Jeff Beck. It wasn't so pretty, but Jeff was, was wonderful that evening and Tal Wickenfeld and Vinny Caliuta. So. I got to meet Jeff briefly backstage because I was friends with Vinny. All right. Great. Let's see, Graham Witcher just says, uh, it'd be interesting to hear Greg's views on CSN and David Crosby in particular. So yeah, I just thought that, you know, like their harmonies are so incredibly tight and interesting and no one could quite ever really sing like those three guys. You know, I remember hearing an interview with, uh, I guess it was Stephen Stills, or is it, or Graham Nash, I heard an interview with him and, you know, like he said, like the first time that they played together, it's like, the, you know, it was, uh, you know, he was just listening in and then the third time he just kind of listened in and just started singing, sing along, like you, you listen to the other two sing uh, and then Graham Nash just kind of on a third time saying, and then they knew that they had like this kind of magic harmony generation machine. So it's always wonderful to listen to. But probably many of us didn't think that uh, David Crosby, uh, even though he's incredibly missed, you know, he led a hard life. So. Chatfield just jumped. All right. Um, all right. So we see just a question. Um, how to delete a custom quantized beat? I made one 
of a loop once and it always shows up. Um, so if we come here, so it's I made this. Um, so I think it just kind of goes into. So, you know, if you select something else, it'll go. And I think it goes into. Um, let me see if it goes into the preset folder where we were at. Yeah, because it might show up in, it might kind of go into the RAM presets. Um, but let's see if we could maybe delete it within the, all right, so let's say if we come here, all right, so um, all you have to do is go to the quantize panel. So right where we go just to the right of that, click on the E, uh, select the particular preset, and now you could come over here and choose to remove the preset. So you could just kind of come directly over there. So again, go to the edit quantize panel, uh, select the preset, and then click on remove. All right, so we have a question. Uh, is Hypnotic Dance Instrument compatible with Cubase 12? Um, I'll just check, see if it's. All right, so I think it might show up inside of Howling and Sonic SE. So we'll come over here. Yeah, so it just shows up as an instrument inside. So maybe not the standalone instrument but if we come over here and let's look at it we can go to the edit so we can see the hypnotic dance just show up directly inside of howling and sonic se so when you go to load you could just say okay i want this to find hypnotic dance and then come over and and you'll have access to kind of all of kind of the and then just click on edit and then you'll have the user interface for hypnotic dance so yeah it definitely works in cubase 12. okay so michael team says what like button whack so see gareth is fixing his daughter's phone so You'll be the hero if you get it to work. So, all right. So we see Rohan just says thanks so much, Greg. Love your class. I'm from Jamaica. Take a trip sometime. So yeah, we're looking. We're trying to figure out our spring break plans to get away. So. We're going between Hawaii, the Caribbean, or Portugal. So we'll try to figure it out maybe over the weekend so we don't have to pay $18 billion for plane tickets. Let's see, Nick has to head off soon, but he just, just dragged the kettle and next door's dog into Howling in 6. So he's going to be doing some sound design this weekend, it looks like. Uh, so we see question, uh, is there any Cubase update coming anytime soon, 12.053 or 12.06? Um, so they're always working on, you know, updating and, you know, creating new enhancements. Um, you know, generally we can't talk about releases until they're done. So, uh, but yeah, you know, rest, you could always feel, you know, very comforted that, you know, the team is very actively working on current and future versions. Okay, so I see uh, Typhoon Williams just says uh, in a sampler track. So let me see if I could find the original question. I think it was with the 808. Let 
just scroll up and see if I could find Yeah, uh, Typhoon, if it was with the 808, if you just want to repeat the question, I know you said with the sampler track, but I just want to have context for the original one. But if you want to repeat it, uh, I'd be happy to, I'm sure we could get to it before the um, before the end of the live stream. Sorry about that. Can we go up so far? See from Graham Witcher, it just says, Greg's knowledge of Cubase never ceases to amaze me. One could spend years of their life learning Cubase and there would still be something new to discover, a revelation of the day. So I'm, I'm still learning new stuff constantly as well. So it's uh, been good job security for me. All right, so we see Jason just says, uh, hi, Greg, 20-year user, first-time commenter. Thank you so much for the continuing education. Keeping up with things is hard. Uh, uh, will we see you at AES in New York City? So um, I don't think we have it on our plan. So obviously trade shows have kind of changed a lot uh, for many companies. I know we're doing the NAM show. Um, so I'm not sure if we're exhibiting, but I may be at the NAM show uh, in April. Uh, in Anaheim, California, and I think that there's going to be an, a NAM show in April and in next January, and then hopefully it's kind of back on the normal schedule. Um, but I'm not sure if there will if Yamaha is going to AES New York City, but I may pop up for a little bit f to see the show. So, I see Pablo is just saying Caliuta, you know, Vinny Caliuta. Such a bad drummer. Yeah, so I got to spend kind of a whole day um, with Vinny. Uh, he came to our office when we were in Chatsworth, California, and he came out for a day. He was a big Cubase nut at the time. Um, and really just you know, super wonderful guy, incredibly humble. And, you know, just got to sit there and, like, spend, like, three or four hours with him. And then I always remember, like, doing that and feeling so great, and I was going like, to – get on a plane to fly home and I, I got, you know, I got a message that, oh, you know, you're not going back to Washington today. You have to go to Hong Kong uh, for a demo tomorrow. And then I realized I didn't have my passport and had to fly back to DC, uh, pick up my passport and then fly to Hong Kong. So I think I was in a plane for like 40 hours basically. But before that, I got to spend a wonderful day with Vinny. Uh, it was really wonderful. And he was kind enough to introduce me to Jeff at the Crossroads Festival. So, see, Jeff Sabelski just says Jeff Beck was in our level above Eric Clapton. And that female bassist, Jeff Beck, collaborated. Yeah, so Tal Wickenfeld. I think that might have been like her first gig. I remember her just like seeing her backstage and she was all happy and excited. So it was really wonderful to see her uh, kind of, you know, become so well-known instantly. I think that might have been like her first gig with um, with Jeff Beck. So. All right. Um so we see question, uh, can I somehow assign uh, control plus mouse wheel scroll to a function in key commands? Um, so not really, you know, because it's not necessarily like a, a key command addressable thing, but something that you can often do is let's say I have on my MIDI remote, uh, like let's say I have an, an encoder. Um, so I'll just do... Maybe a new mapping page. All right, so let's say I want to take this encoder on my, uh, and then we want to go to mouse pointer, AI knob. So don't think that, but you know, 
that we could assign that. But if we come over here and just say, let's do value at mouse pointer and apply the mapping that we could just come over. And now as I hover over different parameters, so let's say if I'm here, um, that uh, let's say I turn this on that I could just hover with my mouse and I could just move this one particular knob. So if I wanted to control my panning, I just move with the mouse. I wanted to control the send level. And again, just kind of move directly with the mouse that we could come right over here and just be able to control. So you can't necessarily assign the scroll wheel as part of a key command. But if you just have an extra knob laying around, it's really super convenient to kind of hover and control over different parameters very easily using kind of the MIDI remote. And again, to set that up is going to be just double click and we'll open the mapping assistant and you'll see mouse pointer AI knob. So select the knob and assign that. And now you can, whatever parameter your cursor is over, it will be controlled. All right, so we have uh, Balas from Budapest. He's a, been a Cubase user since Atari days, so thank you so much for joining the live stream. All right, so we have a prob uh, question. Um, how to export a chord track for use in other software? So I don't know if many you know chord tracks um, often can't necessarily be exported, but I don't know anything that could be, uh, particular, particularly, um, you know, that would import them. But if you want it to have kind of like the chord data, so let's say I want to add an instrument track here. Um, one of the things that you can do is, you know, most programs could, you know, take a particular MIDI event and, you know, create chords based on that. So, um, so if I wanted to take the chord track and drag it down, we can now select, and if we solo this particular track, um, what we could do is now just choose to export, um, you know, this entire track. And if we wanted to hold down, grab the glue gun, and if we wanted to hold down alter option, we could glue this all as one contiguous part. And then we could export a MIDI file uh, that has like, you know, the playing chords that could then be imported into something. But I don't know of, you know, it's not, that would be the way to kind of export the chord track data because I don't know anything that would import it. Um, so, you know, they might think of exporting it if, you know, but it's not like kind of a standard uh, file format that's used for interchange. But the MIDI file uh, could be a way of doing that. So maybe you just drag it down to a particular track and then you could export the MIDI part. All right, wonderful to see root screen on. All right, so we see uh, from Hilberto Alcuna Bautista, um, I see that questions in Spanish. So I see um, that you're from Veracruz, Mexico. You're a victim of software Cubase 8.1. So uh, if maybe someone is, uh, I see maybe Pablo is going to try to translate for me. Um, but maybe if you could uh, translate into English, maybe I could help. Troca says, Greg, come to Portugal, jam with me. So my wife is leaning towards Portugal, so we'll have to see where we end up. We'll have to see if we get a passport for my son in time. All 
so we see, hi, Greg, do you have an idea how to record sound from YouTube into Cubase 12 Pro on Windows, perhaps with a second audio interface, system sound to the second, then cabling from second into main interface? You could do that, but there's also, let me see if I, I mean, have this as a bookmark. Um, but there is like websites that you could, I don't think I have it, uh, but look for there, there's a number of websites and utilities that you could actually just kind of you know enter in a youtube address and then it could generate like an mp3 file for you you could take it out and re-record it back in um you know through a second interface but you could just simply uh you know there's a number of software utilities where you just copy the youtube link and then you could punt you know, punch that in, paste it in, and then say, you know, go there, create an MP3 file and save it here. So maybe that's a, a different approach that might work well for you. And we see Jazz D is just mentioning you could probably use some utility like voice meter for doing that. All right, uh, so we just see a question. Um, my, of course, my. Uh, so you just see a question, uh, how can I record any kind of melody on Halion Sonic? I play something, but I can't record it. The line goes in blank. All right. So make sure that you're using like a MIDI controller of some kind. So let's say if I do, we'll just do a new project. And we'll add an instrument track. And so we'll do a Halion Sonic SE. All right, so if you come over here and hit record and you're playing just the keys and stop, then it's gonna be blank because these don't transmit MIDI. So what you could do if you don't have a keyboard is hit Alt or Option plus the letter K. And now when you record, you can do pitch band and modulation. And then you could see that, or if you have just a MIDI controller, you could just come right over here, hit record, and... But these particular MIDI notes don't actually transmit any MIDI themselves. So make sure that you're using a MIDI keyboard or Alt or Option plus the letter K, like as in keep then you could use this as a software MIDI keyboard that you could play from your computer keyboard. So you could just treat it like that. All right, let's see how we're doing on time. All right, we're doing great. Thanks for all the wonderful questions. Again, if you've learned something new, make sure that you do hit the like button and subscribe to the channel. Okay, so you see, uh, how do I copy an 808 bass track via sampler MIDI to kick track sampler MIDI? Um, okay, so let me just. Let me just see if I have this.
Okay, so let's say if I have um, like an 808 bass kind of sound. So let's say if I have this, so let's say, all right, so let's say I am gonna drag this to my sampler track. So let's say, okay, I'll just drag this right into my sampler track. I think it's E0 is the root pitch. Okay, so um, an 808 bass track by sampler, uh, MIDI to kick track sampler. MIDI. Okay, so let's say we have our bass. So let, let's say if I have like a kick pattern. Okay, so let me just find. All right, so say we have this going on. So, so let's say if these, if I wanted to, um, all right, so let's say I want to take like this particular, like let's say I have this kick. All right, so what I'm going to do is just come here. Um, let me know if this is kind of what you want. So let's say if I wanted like my bass on the 808 to automatically follow these particular kicks. So I'm going to go to my hit points and we'll edit the hit points. So we'll just, as we look at this, we could see that we will. All See our hit points. Um, and then I'm gonna create MIDI notes and let's put them on the first selected track. So now I'm gonna have my 808, let's say my kick. And then if I wanted to change the pitch, And let's say if I wanted this to be longer. And if I wanted to put these into legato mode, um, we could just kind of come over here to MIDI to functions and let's choose uh, legato. So now as we play, So you could do stuff like that if you wanted to, or just. So I say, okay, I want just this one to be longer and you could just kind of pick and choose. So maybe if that's kind of what you want to do, just let me know. If that kind of makes sense from for you, Typhoon. See comment from Pablo. Um, and I'm not sure if anyone could translate uh, Hilberto's uh, situation from Spanish to English for me. 
Um, but you see Pablo just says, you have great friends, Greg, because you're a great person as well. So I've been lucky to meet uh, so many of my idols growing up and spend time with them and help them, which is always a thrill. So. All right, um, so we have a question. Uh, can you tell something about the workspaces? All right, so what workspaces are, it's, you know, we may have like different sets of windows that will be open. So let's say in this case, um, I'll jump back to a different project. Um, all right, so let's say this is our active project and you know we could have a myriad of windows and different views of data that's a possible inside of Cubase. So, but what we could do here is just say, okay, I want to take this and let's say I'm going into very audio. So I want to take my very audio view here. All right, and let's say, okay, I like this view. So I'm gonna be having to go back to this area a lot. So I want to come over here and let's add a workspace. So, and we could do it on at a global level, a global workspace, which is available for everything or a project. So say, okay, this project I have audio. So with a vocal, so I'm gonna say, this is my very audio preset. And let's say I wanted to come over to Groove Agent here and let's select this and go into um, so let's say, okay, let's go to our drum editor. All right, so we'll just come over to workspaces, add a workspace, sorry about that. So workspaces and so let's add and we'll say for our project, drum. Okay, and we also want to take maybe, um, we want to take our piano part. And then we want to look at this in notation. All right, so let's come over here and add a workspace. So if I'm constantly kind of jumping back between these different views, I could now, if I did everything right, I could say, okay, let's go to a workspace uh, and I want to go to very audio. So at this point, uh, we're right back here. I want to go to, um, you know, my piano score. I want to go to my drum editor. So instead of having to open up all these different windows, I could just have my workspace organizer and I could say, okay, I want to go to my bigger mixer on all this view. I want to go back to see supervision uh, or, you know, so we could just kind of go to our workspaces and immediately jump to different views without having to open up and close a, a whole, a collection of windows to get to the view we want. All right, so we see uh, Jack C asks, uh, my undo doesn't work on accidentally deleted insert. Is this normal? So there's an edit undo history as well as a mixer undo history. So let's say I added an audio track. Okay, I'll come here, let's get to our mixer. Um, all right, so let's say I move this. Now if I hit Control Z, uh, it's not gonna affect my particular like level because I moved the level. And let's say I come over and I adjust my EQ, I add an insert, um, and now I got rid of that insert. So once we do this, if we hit Alt or Option plus Z instead of Control or Command plus Z, 
this will be an undo history and we could also access this directly from this little icon here. So there's a mixer undo history. So alter option Z. Now I could undo uh, my deletion of the plugin. Now I undo the adding of the plugin, my EQs, my, vo my volume, you know. So this way an alt shift or alter option plus shift plus the letter Z will give you your redo. So we could just come over and undo and redo independently. So the mixer undo history, alter option plus Z, the edit undo history is control or command plus Z or and shift for redo for both of those. So, and you could actually, if you come to like the full screen mixer and you go to your edit history, you could see all of the changes that you made in your mixer. So now you'll never complete a mix because you never have to make a decision. Just kidding. Um, so you see Val Lee that may have missed his question on the UR22. So let me just see. Uh, please feel free to ask again. Let me see if I could find it. Quickly, I'll scroll up. Sorry, I think I missed your question last week too. Okay. Is your comment about Tal Wickenfeld? So you comment to Graham. There you scrolling up looking. So you comment to Uno Memento. See about the green screen. So, Valley, if you want to you know, please ask your question again, and we'll see if we can get to it. Sorry about that. All right, let me see if I can. So Pablo says, Greg, you always impress me with Cubase. Well, thank you for the kind words. It is my job after all. So. I'm just trying to find my spot. Sorry, just. All right, so you see from uh, Sable Winters, um, Question, how to read the chord track? The top line looks like a melody. And what is the bottom line in the next bar? So let me just see. Um, so it, let's say if we're on this particular project, um, so as we kind of zoom in, you can see the chord track here. Um, so let me know if that's, maybe it was just uh, the zoom factor, you know, maybe that was it, Sable. Um, and then when we 
as we dragged it down, if we double click, you know, this is just going to make MIDI data of all of the chords. So that would just kind of create MIDI notes uh, based on the chords and the timing of the chord track. So, but let me know if I'm misunderstanding. So Gareth says the secret of getting the most out of Halion is to fill up those patch layers very easy to do and get great hybrid sounds. Yeah. All right, so we see Michael Teens has to head out. So thanks for joining us and for all the virtual ice cream. See, uh, Choka, if I missed your question, please feel free to repeat it. Sorry about that. All right, uh, so you said, uh, can you do random velocity? So let's say if I want to take uh, my velocity of all of my chords here and randomize it. Again, and we showed this a bit earlier, so let's go to logical editor. Um, let's say we want to transform. Uh, type is equal, or we'll say value two. And then we will set random values between 40 and 100. And let me see if I have to select. Here, I'll just remove this, let's say notes. Yeah, so usually it's kind of just set up. Let me just see if there's probably a factory preset for this. Okay. So yeah, so there's a preset for it that you could just use and now we could just Completely randomize the velocity, minus 10 to 10 values like that. Right, so we see uh, from Typhoon Williams, it says, loves it, Nuendo's goat, greatest of all time, I assume. All right, so we see question, uh, very audio, why another created sound I tried? Um,
Okay, so I'm not sure if it's, um, so let's say if we have a vocal file, so sometimes um, I see why another created sound, I try. Um, so sometimes I get people that want to do like a quick harmony, uh, and what they often do is uh, duplicate the track, and then they want to go into this very audio editor and say, okay, I move this pitch, um, and then when I come over here, that it's going to be the same edit that's applied to both of them. Um, so if it if that is a scenario and you want to, you know, just come okay. here. Guess all along I was so naive. So if I come here and say, okay, I want to take this particular note. Okay. Guess all along I was so naive. Let's say, okay, I'll take this and change that. Um, that we could do a new version, and now I could just. Guess all along, I was so naive. So, not, so, but you know, if you need to, if you're duplicating it, I'm not sure when you say uh, create it sound. I tried now. If it's where you're not hearing the 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 changes as we're like doing a very audio edit where you're not hearing that make sure that you have this little speaker icon turned on and then you could just come uh directly over here so let me know if that's kind of what you were talking about um so All right, so we see Trocas in Porto. So I'll have to look it up on the map, but love to visit the Iberian Peninsula. So, all right, and Pablo saying Gareth is from Antarctica. So we have our Antarctica viewer. All right, so we have a question. Uh, I would like my main out and groups on the right side in zones. It doesn't do that automatically. Uh, is there a setting? You know, so a lot of people, when we come over here, if you want it to have, you know, particular, uh, so we go to visibility and to zones. Um, so a lot of people that would do this would just automatically start from a template. Um, so this way we can see that wherever I am in my project that my master stereo out is, kind of anchored to the right. Um, so we go to our input and if I put it in the center now, our master output could disappear. So once you kind of set that in the project, so again, go to your input output and then choose it to be on the right. Or if you want the lead vocal to always be in the left, you could anchor those just by clicking, but there's not an automatic way of doing it. But if you have that stored within a particular template and you're starting new projects from that template, then you should be all set. See the heartbreak time machine. I just learned there was a mixer undo. Oh my God. So that's a great feature. I think that came in like 10 or 10 five, something like that. Maybe nine five. We see Gareth is a fan of Portugal. All right, uh, so we see from Harry Olive. Uh, Hi, Greg, in sampler track, would it be possible to set the pitches for each slice? If not, it would be an amazing feature to have. So we could already do that using uh, the uh, using Groove Agent. So let's say, I'll just do, um, let's just jump back to different project here. Okay, so let's say I have an instance of Groove Agent here and I'll just kind of blow out all of the samples. So we'll come here, we'll cut the kit. So I'm gonna drag this loop over onto the pad. Uh, and then we go to Slice. 
Uh, and then I'll say create slices. So now, so let's say I want to take this snare. Uh, let's go to our pitch tab and I just want to come over here. And this one I want it. So let's say, let's make this one down. So now if I wanted to play the pattern. So at that point, all you had to do is just select and then you could change the pitch. And even if you said, okay, I wanted to randomize the pitch of this one, I want to take And let's say this one, I wanted to do a pitch envelope so that the pitch kind of goes down and up. We could do some stuff like that. All right. So, but yeah, so Groove Agent is a perfect tool for working with that. So, uh, so instead of sampler track, you use Groove Agent SE, which comes with Cubase for that. All right, let's get to our next question. All right, sorry, my chat field just jumped on me. All right, so you see if I go to Portugal, we could be in a jam session. So I may not bring my bass, but if there's one there, I would be happy to play. Sounds like fun. Okay, so we see Valley's question. Thanks for re-asking it. Sorry about that. So uh, mix knob on the UR22C. How's it in relationship with mix? Where do I get the pure DAW sound? Ask again because the question gets deleted. So um, I think, um, so let me just look at a picture of it so I could tell you the right thing. I have a UR242, but it's kind of buried under a desk. You know, with the UR22C, you could actually just do the, the straight direct monitoring. So uh, via the DSP, because it does have DSP built in. So let's go ahead and look at, um, so the mix knob. So when you say, okay, so if you want it to, so if you turn it to the left towards the input, then you're gonna be monitoring solely kind of the input of the source, but you don't hear the backing tracks. So moving the mix knob to the left uh, allows you to hear the input more and then you could blend in like the backing tracks, uh, blending it to the right here. So just on the DAW mode. So give that, a, so just move it to the left but you could also, um, so the more to the left, you hear more of the incoming sound that you're recording and more to the right, you hear the backing track. Thank you again for re-asking your question. Sorry, I missed it. All right, uh, so we see question, how do you cut a section between locators? Okay, so let's say, um, okay, there's kind of two approaches. So let's say I have my left and right locator set here. So if you go to edit, 
to range, you could say, okay, I want to cut time and that will kind of move like whatever comes after it. But if you go to edit to range, you could also just say insert silence that could move between, but, and let's say, I think if I just come here and where my range is set, um, so let, let's say if I, let's say if I have that selected as my range, and one of the things you could do is, let's say, if I have a marker track, so I'll just add a marker track here, and I'm gonna put it into this zone, so if you Double click, let's see if it works. So if we have, you know, one of the things you could do is if we have, I know if we have like markers set, so let's say if I go to two and let's say insert a cycle marker. So let's say if I have two markers set at the beginning, at the end, if you wanted to just double click on the marker track uh, with the range selection tool, then you could just hit the delete key if you wanted to. So, um, so if you, that's an easy way to just kind of say, okay, you know, set one and two. So add the markers and double click with the range selection tool and hit the delete key. And then if you wanted to just move the content of this over, it's just control or command shift X and that will move it over like so. So let me know if that's helpful. high recommendations for Portugal. I'm kind of leaning toward Maui myself, just because I saw my wife was like so on vacation and relaxed there, so. But we'll have to, I'll let you guys know. It'll probably be sometime like first week of April. All right, uh, so we see, Greg, uh, last question for today. If I add an insert as post, will it be before or after the channel strip? Um, all right, so let's take a look at it. So I think if it is post fader, so let me, all right, so we have an insert here. So let's say, okay, we add, or delay and that's post. So I think that, um, I think it's still going to be before the channel strip, but it's not going to be, if the gain isn't going to be affected, um, you know, or the gain will be affected by the level of the volume, unless you come over here and switch the channel strip to be first. So you can just kind of click and have the channel strip before the signal flow of the inserts or have the or the inserts first. So you can kind of toggle back and forth as to which comes first. But I think that's gonna be more for uh, if the input of the effect is affected by the fader or not. But I still think it's before the channel strip unless you specifically place the channel strip first. I'm seeing if I can catch Troka's question. Just, you could always uh, feel free to ask it again if you, um, I see a lot of comments about jams in Portugal. Uh, but feel free to ask your question again. Um, let's see, we can get better wines. And that you're in Porto. I wish I had his image, his level of self image. 
Let's see, okay, boss. Uh, so yeah, Troka, just just ask your question again. I'm sorry if I missed it. Um, it wasn't intentional. All right, trying to get back to where we were. Yeah, and if someone else sees Troka question, let me know. And you see Nick just says sometimes Google eats questions. All right, so we have a question. Uh, if I duplicate a part of a track and edit that, the original track also changes. Yeah, because it's gonna be often using the same audio file. So let's say if I come here and I move, you know, I make a copy of this particular section and then I do a, let's say I go come over here and I reverse, I do a fade out on that, that, you know, we could see that this would have an effect on this, let's say if I reverse this, that, you know, we come over here, let's say, okay, let's reverse that. Now, sometimes you will get this little prompt that says, do you wanna make a new version? So I'll just say continue, and we can see that whatever change I made here is made there. So you get that little prompt, but there's a preference if you always uh, want it to create a new file. So go to editing, to audio, and on processing shared clips, uh, you could have it automatically create a new version. And then, because it is the same audio file, even if it's in different locations, it's the same underlying file. So if you did a process on the same file, anytime that that file is appears, if you have it set to you know process existing clip, then it would do it to all files, but you could just have it choose to create new version on the processing shared clips. So try setting that preference again under preferences, editing, audio on processing shared clips. Okay, just um, all right. So we have from uh, Luis. Um, when I'm looking at a wave file in a project window, how do I set the view so it's not either zoom in or zoom out? Um, so you know, if it's something, let me just revert this. You know, if we're here, so, you know, if it's, you know, there is like a different zoom factor for kind of the amplitude that could sometimes be deceiving, like, oh, why is everything like totally distorted and compressed looking? Uh, so, or if that's the zoom, I mean, so you could always, you know, if you come here, let's say if you're, if you don't want it to always be zoomed in and out, one of the things you could do is, Let's say if we go to edit and let's go to zoom, just say zoom full, and then you could see kind of everything. Uh, but the length of the audio file, um, you know, so if you wanted to view it, you know, I would maybe set it to zoom full and then you could see the entire contents. Uh, but, you know, to see it within the project, you may have to have some level of zoom uh, to see it, so. And Choka, if you want to email me with your question. Um, yeah, and I see John Costigan will resend it, so. 
but you could always email to clubcubase at steinberg.de. I don't know if anyone else has seen the question, uh, but if someone else sees a question, please feel free to kind of retype it in for me. All right, so wonderful to see Michael Pierce on. All right, and he's prepping to go to Luton Airport at 2.30 a.m., so I don't miss getting up for the airport at 4 a.m., but we hope you have a safe trip. All right, we see Dwight just said, hi, Greg, great session today. See, so Nick is enjoying his Hallian. All right, so we see from Valley, uh, where is the DAW sound with the mix knob, uh, the purest DAW sound important for making mix, mixing decisions? Sorry if I asked wrong. So usually on that particular, um, I would put it in the center and there's like a center detente, like a little knob and that way you're not monitoring. Um, so, but basically that has like a bigger effect. Like if you don't, you know, just put it in the center and that way you're not like, attenu you're not adjusting the volume either up or down. So just leave uh, the mix control knob in the center. Um, so, and then, you know, if it's in the center, then you don't have any impact of that knob. Okay, so I see Choka just says, better working like that. And, and Nick isn't seeing a question. So maybe the question is too many characters, Choka? So I think there's might be like a 200 character limit. But if you want to send me an email again, we could do it on Tuesday's live stream. Um, all right, so we see from Jeff Sabelski, uh, what is the easiest way to change from external to internal effects using the MR816 CSX, which I've had for a very long time? Uh, do all projects need to be closed first to set the new mode of use? So you just kind of set it, and I don't have one to really show, but when you go into the uh, hardware setup, you could just switch it there, and you could do it on the fly. So you could switch between the internal and external without having to restart. So. All right, so I know we have some questions that were emailed in advance, so let me get to those. Thank you for all the wonderful questions. And again, if you've learned something new, make sure that you do uh, hit the like button and that you uh, subscribe to the channel. So we see we're at 145 likes, it's wonderful. All right, so let me come over here. All right, so we had a question. Um, how to resolve EQ clashes between two tracks? Okay, so let's say, um, try this. Okay, so let's say I wanna take my guitar track uh, and let's say it was clashing with uh, like maybe the piano part. So as we're here, let me just make sure my routing is. So let's say I wanted to check out the EQ of these two different tracks. And let's say they were kind of conflicting with each other. So what I could do is just kind of come over here and let's go to I'll open up the EQ of one channel. And we have this EQ comparison, activate channel comparison mode. So I'm going to select Let's say my Verve piano. So once I do this, I can now just kind of switch between 
So if I wanted to EQ, I could see the frequencies here of my Verve piano. So now if I click on the guitar, I'm EQing the guitar. And then we could actually adjust kind of the overlay. So we say the transparency for the reference track, let's increase that. Say 100%. So again, now I'm EQing. And we'll just look at it on a channel curve. So just kind of bring that out a little more. So switch. Now I'm EQing the guitar, and I can see kind of what's going on sonically between the two tracks. So that way you could easily kind of find clashing frequencies and be able to EQ the two tracks in kind of an intelligent way against each other. All right, another question is emailed in, how to set the cursor when clicking in a project window? All right, so when we click on the project window, um, you know, one of the preferences can be set to, you know, click on empty space. So let's say if we go to transport, I think it's locate when clicked in an empty space. So we could just, when we click in an empty space, but sometimes you may have a project where that's not really, where you can't really do that. So if you hold down alt and, or option plus shift, you can now click anywhere and that will move the playhead of the cursor like so. So instead of selecting the event, holding down Alt plus Shift, we'll just come over here and move the particular events cursor just like that. Okay, uh, so we had a question, uh, how to make hidden tracks visible? So all you need to do is to come over here and we see our visibility tab. So let's say if I wanted to hide my lead vocal track, uh, so if you go to the visibility tab, whatever is checked is visible, but if I don't see a check, then I could click directly here and hide or show the track to make it visible, invisible, visible, invisible, just by clicking on that check. All right, so we see a question, uh, how to fix tempo detection out of grid with drum fills. Uh, tempo detection works perfectly, but after example drum fills, it sometimes happens that the synchronism is out of grid. I succeeded using the tempo track, but can't handle, uh, but I can't handle the warp grid tool. What am I doing wrong? Okay, so let's say if we do a tempo detection, so we'll just come over here, let's import brand new raw track. Okay, so we'll do a quick tempo detection here. Now you may notice that as we do the tempo detection, so we'll just, just adjust this down and we'll bring this up. So we don't really have a tempo aligned. So I'm going to go to project and so you go to tempo detection. All right. Now, as we, as it's done this, let's say we'll just, so if there's like a drum fill that kind of like wigs it out, it places you into like the warp grid mode automatically. So let's say maybe coming up here. So I would listen to it. So let's say maybe right there, uh, I wanted to zoom in and let's say, and if we have this particular icon 
on, but you can say, okay, this really should have been, this hit should have been kind of right here. So we could move, you know, this particular, you know, let's just come here. So let's say we want to move the tempo track. Um, and then as the tempo track will be adjusted here, it will automatically recalculate. So make sure that you actually have, um, you know, so let's say we do an analysis here. And then, you know, make sure that also we're in the warp grid mode. So now we say, okay, like, let's say this particular pattern uh, was off starting right here. So what we need to do is say, okay, grab this. And now it's going to automatically recalculate every tempo after that particular point to make sure that it's working. So before you leave the tempo detection dialog box, you know, A, make sure that it's the warp mode is automatically set to warp grid as opposed to free warp with that. And I think you'll be okay. All right, so we see a question. Hello, Greg. After importing all my tracks into a project, I would like to change the name of all tracks for something that makes sense to me. Uh, is there a way that all tracks and original file name inside audio folder change names as well to have consistency? Um, so if we've imported a number of tracks, let's come over here and I'll just... Remove these. All right, so let's come over and import a bunch of tracks. All right, so we're going to, we'll reuse and we'll put these onto different tracks. All right, so now if we've imported it that way, the track names are automatically derived from the particular, from the audio file name. If we drag them to existing tracks, now if we wanted to change the names of these files, what we could do is just kind of come over here and say, okay, I want this, hold down the control key uh, or command and we can see that the name of the file has changed in the description. Uh, so try that, but maybe just import the tracks and that will automatically be carried over. But if you come over here, hit the tab key, hold down control, enter, you know, but you can navigate quickly kind of using the tab key to rename various tracks. And then once you have those named, you know, just come here select and hold down control or command and that will rename the file for you. All right, uh, it says uh, question, good morning, Greg. Uh, can you tell me how to open up a new project and all my tracks and settings, including plugins from my last session so I may be able to AB them? I want to add a new session without losing the original session. All right, so let's say I'm in this project here. So, all right, so we have this. Um, what you could do is when we go to import tracks from project. So what I want to do is we'll go to file and import tracks from project. Uh, so we could select a particular project here. So we'll just select this. Um, all right. Now what you could do is at this point, we could say select all. We could destination track. We could say select matching. And on our tracks and data to be imported, we can choose. We don't, we don't want the events and parts to be incorporated. We just want the channel and track inspector settings. You may not want, you may or may not want automation, but just choose like channel and track inspector settings. 
and now we could have all of those settings uh, automatically uh, import it directly over like so. And we can do it for the selected tracks or for all tracks. All right, so we had a question, uh, someone wanting to, uh, like from a macro, to be able to see if I still have this macro to start with. All right, and what they want to do like for an editing session is to be able to kind of um, take a particular track uh, with a color and be able to, you know, take just a particular region and turn it red and copy it so that they could replace, like, let's say this was the better guitar part and they want to replace it in another section of the song. So let me just see if I still have this macro available. So I made a project logical editor preset. So let's come over here to macros. Um, see if I remember the name of the macro. split and select range. I think this was it. So let's go to, uh, so let's go to my key commands. So our macros split and select. It's under CCLS. Okay, so and what we're going to do That's not it. So let me just see. Well, I, I, I'll email privately to Joe uh, since I don't have the macro that I could find quickly. So, but um, I'll send that over to Joe. Sorry about that, Joe. All right. All right. So we have a question. Um, is it possible to keep playing my keyboard alongside, alongside the singer while he is recording? So certainly if you wanted to... Uh, record the singer. So let's say if we come here, let's add an instrument track. Um, so we'll go ahead add our instrument track. So we'll have this going on. Let's add an audio track. All right, so let's say I'm just playing my instrument. So I could be playing uh, and not recording my instrument or recording the instrument while the vocals is recording. So if I don't want to record my part, I could just put the monitor on and then I could play with the singer. And if I wanted to record my part, say, oh, that's really good. Now just record enable and I could record all while the singer continues to record their part. So no problem at all. All right, uh, second question. Uh, can I group or link notes like grouping events? I mean, when I open a MIDI event in an editor, can I choose some notes and link it in a group so I can control them together? I mean, a real link when I unselect them only and then select one note, the other will be selected automatically. So I don't think that there's a way in Cubase of doing that. So if we wanted to look at a uh, you know, particular MIDI parts or MIDI events as we come in, here we could just say, okay, I want to select these. So once it's selected, there isn't necessarily a way of grouping those particular notes together. So you'd have to reselect them. So it's not like uh, where you could control G in the MIDI editor, come back and select one and they're still all selected. So uh, let's see if we could do it on maybe the in place editor. So if we hit control shift I and let's see if we could do it here. So let's say control G. No, so it doesn't carry over into the MIDI in place editor. So Cubase doesn't have that, unfortunately. All 
All right. Uh, can you question? Can you please uh, provide a good vocal recording template uh, and as well as a mixing template loaded with the stock plugins to be ready to start to mix and vocal recording? It's always better to start off with something. So what I would do for like a particular vocal um, session is maybe instead of a template, you know, experiment with the track presets. So let's say this is your vocal, and if you come over to media and go to uh, presets. And then you'll see track presets, say audio, and then I want this for, you know, vocals. Um, so at this point, you could just say, okay, I want this for. Uh, and now we could just come over here and you could just drag and drop these uh, track presets. So we go to the inspector and we look at this. I could just say, we'll just keep this uh, on always on top. So if I just drag over another preset I could just come right over here and just start with track preset so even when you go to add a track you could just say okay I want to add this uh, using a track preset and just say okay I want this to be vocal and okay now I'm here and then I start off with my track preset as the track is added all right so we see uh, how to select multiple channels on the mix console. Tried using shift and control on selecting within the meter area. So, um, yeah, so I've never really had an issue with this. So let, let's say if I'm in the mix console, I just select here and then shift key and that will select. If I wanted to do it non-contiguously, uh, I could just say, okay, I want this one. Uh, that's when I would hold control or command. Uh, but you know, if I wanted to select all of them together, uh, like between two points, all the tracks, I would hold down shift. If I wanted to, you know, select non-contiguously or just, you know, not necessarily a particular pattern, then I would hold down a control key. All right, so we have a question. Um, is there a way to get my MIDI drum multiple takes with comping the option same as we do easily with audio multiple takes in Cubase, please. Thanks in advance. All right, so let's take a look. Let's come over to new project. Open, let's just drop in a groove agent. Okay, so there's different MIDI recording modes for this. So I'm going to just come over here. I'll just load a quick kit. All right, so I'm gonna put it into like, just a quick like two measure loop. Okay, and what we want to do is just to set this, uh, we'll go to our MIDI record mode here, and I'm gonna put it into mix stacked no mute. And we're gonna do just a quick like cycle record. Um, so let me just. So now when I come over here, I can do my kick. And let me just put it on, get my octave right. Okay, so I'll just start over and we'll do this really quick. All right, so now I just want to. All right, and I'll just put in some. All right, so now that I've done this, uh, they each will continue to play back. We could switch between our different takes, but if we come over to lanes, we could see that now we're gonna have, you know, just, and we could just kind of use our comping tool if we want to mute. So we say, okay, I just wanna hear my kick. But these will all be kind of stacked. And if you wanted to 
comp just like you would with audio. You can do that. So just set your MIDI record mode here to mix stacked, no mute. And that should behave just like audio for comping MIDI drum parts. All right, let's see if we get one more question in before we have to wrap up. So I'm gonna go back to the live chat. So make sure everyone, is, uh, just thanks everyone for all the wonderful questions. Uh, and I hope everyone has learned something new. Uh, so Sable Winters, yeah. So I think we did do the um, we did do the core track question. All right. So you see, Jeff Sabelski says for the wife Maui first, then Portugal. So all right, good advice. All right. So we said a uh, question. Um, Cubase Pro Twelve. How can I set an encoder on a controller to be a track selector, like up, down arrows? Um, so realize that a lot of encoders will just um, only go in one direction. So let's say I want it to go, see if we, I think we get this in. So let's come over here. Um, let's go to our MIDI remote. All right, and let's come to, all right, so we I wanna take this encoder and I'll just say next track. All right, so we'll say select next track under actions. All right, let's apply the mapping. And let's say I wanna do this encoder to previous track. So most encoders won't necessarily transmit different MIDI CCs for going one direction or another direction. All right, so now I have these kind of mapped to those two functions with the encoders. I will add, let's say, a number of audio tracks here. All right. And now that I'm here, I will just move the encoder and I could go back and forward. So just using my two encoders like that. Okay, with that, we're just about out of time. I want to thank everyone for all the wonderful questions. And again, we do this every Tuesday and Friday starting at 1 p.m. U.S. Eastern. I want everyone to stay safe and healthy over the weekend. Uh, and if you have questions, please send them. If you want to send in advance, send them to clubcubase at steinberg.de. And we will see everyone on Tuesday. Looking forward to catching up with everyone again. Thanks for spending your afternoon with me. And we'll be back Tuesday. Thank you so much. Goodbye.